that figure. And so they were tasked uh, with a number of things that they would like to report back to you. And this was really the culmination of, of those nine months of effort. Uh, and there's actually a matter on your agenda to contemplate continuing with this group to help uh, see this across the finish line at some point. So uh, with that, I know that the chairman, uh, Freeman, of the committee is here and is going to kind of lead the process, but he has a lot of supporting cast here, too. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, uh, I was looking at it today. We actually came together as a um, ad hoc committee with our first meeting on November 30th, and I, and I believe this is our 20th meeting mm -hmm. together as a group. Um, and, I, and I do want to recognize um, uh, committee members uh, uh, who are here tonight, and I think almost everyone is here. Uh, Greg Hanscom, Bruce Bell, Roger Shabbat, Susan Hamill, David Libby, Rick Meinking, Rocky Rosbera, Judy Roy, uh, Councillor Hayes, Councillor St. Clair, Chief Thurlow, Chief Moulton. Um, but we also had a lot of support uh, from town staff, um, Larissa Crockett, Angela Blanchett, Carrie Grantham, Karen Martin, Jennifer Lim, um, and a lot of the staffers from uh, the public safety, uh, both fire and police, um, were actively involved in at almost every meeting that we had. It, it uh, was uh, quite a process, and later on, I'll formally introduce uh, Jeff Shaw from uh, Context Architecture. Um, the first uh, thing that we wanted to talk about was that committee charge that you gave us uh, back in November. Um, we uh, started off by everyone uh, reviewed the 2008 feasibility study um, that was performed by Garan Turgeon Architects and supported by uh, Pizzagalli Construction at the time. Um, that was a 43,000 square foot structure that was contemplated in 2008. And it looked at um, one of the sites was next to the veterans' home. Uh, then there was a, it, it kind of bounced a little bit, uh, but it was a, it was a very high level um, feasibility study that was done. I would say in comparison, we've really got a little more meat to this. Um, and, uh, but it served as the basis of what we're going to present you tonight. Um, the other charge was that we were, uh, we were to consider other town facility needs. Uh, probably most emphatically, it was the, uh, the IT department. And we um, had it in the project to begin with and, and saw that we couldn't keep it. But we've tried uh, working with Jennifer Lim and, and her department to really kind of bring about the most efficient use of the space that we've allotted um, for um, other staff. We've also considered, you know, community service needs um, in other departments. We just kind of just kind of looked at the whole. Um, we have considered energy efficiency and life cycle costs uh, as charged by uh, you, the council. Um, our committee includes members of the energy committee, Judy Roy and Rick Meinking. Of course, Rick is professionally works with Efficiency Maine, so they really brought a lot of uh, talent. Um, and, and uh, experience to our committee. Um, we've incorporated uh, public involvement throughout the process. Um, our meetings have been open. Uh, we've had all our material up on the our agendas and support material has been up on the town website. Um, and we did have a community dialogue uh, back in June where we really kind of unveiled the project. And uh, throughout the way, we've explored best practices and we've toured similar facilities. That was really the first thing that we did. Uh, we all came up to speed on public safety. Uh, but we also got out, we, we visited uh, facilities in Brunswick and Topsom. Um, we went to Saco, Westbrook, Gorham, uh, really kind of delved, delved into a lot of the other facilities that, um, that have been built here in, uh, recently. Uh, tonight, you will find, uh, you asked us to deliver to you a site selection assessment, a space needs assessment, a schematic design, and a probable cost estimate. Um, so when Jeff uh, Shaw from Context takes over, um, we, will, we will give you all those details that you asked for. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll introduce uh, Police Chief Robert Walton and Fire Chief Michael Thurlow. Thank you, Kevin. 
and thank you for your leadership on the committee. It's it's really been a exciting and, and uh, very enjoyable process for not only you but the entire committee. Really enjoyed it. We just put a handful of slides in here to talk about the need for the facility and why this is the right time. And, and our needs really focus on five main topic areas: access and egress from that site. Um, the space constraints that we're under there with our current staffing and uh, needs, the uh, changes in the departments and the community over the years since we last expanded, uh, changes in service expectations, and then we added the deferred maintenance and improvements because where, as you know, this has been in a dialogue and there's been a process for over 10 years now, and during that time, uh, we went through the recession and obviously there were reasons why we delayed, but um, we have deferred a lot of maintenance and a lot of cost thinking that this was coming on and we didn't want to spend good money after bad. So that is certainly a, a subject that if uh, this doesn't become fruitful that we'll have to revisit. So to start off with, the first piece is the access and egress uh, piece and uh, we got this aerial shot with, with a drone, but this really is a, a, an everyday occurrence, especially this time of year. And I think what we're trying to illustrate here is that even though people are very supportive and try to yield, uh, it is impossible to yield and let us get out of our station uh, during the peak travel times. Uh, and this shot really helps illustrate that. Uh, very often it takes me five or six cycles of the lights to turn left to go home at, at night. And uh, you can see that it's just so tightly packed at the intersection that um, they can't get out of the way if they want to. So we just looked at some of the uh, some of the issues that we're dealing with in terms of space, and many of you have been through the building, so you've seen these yourself. Um, some of them are a little bit difficult to see, but uh, just uh, going through those quickly, you see up in the upper left-hand corner the the famous uh, office made out of filing cabinets and and wallboard on top. That's where Jim Butler does does his work. Um, that's a fairly unique situation. Um, and I would also say that as you, without, we don't have pictures of it, but I think one of the main things that I tell people as we go through the building is uh, not just these issues, but every place that you go up and down the hallway, there's fax machines, there's copy machines, there's bookcases, there's tables, there's all kinds of things that really shouldn't be where they are. You don't, just don't have a lot of uh, opportunity to do things differently. The next uh, one on the top is uh, one of the bunks where the uh, full-time firefighters, paramedics uh, stay at night and as you can see there's not a lot of space there, a, a small closet with uh, not much room for anything and, and no privacy at all. Uh, the next slide in the middle up top is the radio room. We have a lot of radio technicians that need to go in and from time to time and, and uh, troubleshoot uh, different radio issues and it's hard to tell from this picture but it's really difficult uh, for an individual, an adult, to, uh, to let alone stand in, in the middle of this room, but to have to try to work and, and chase things, problems down, it's really, really difficult. The next one is the uh, what started its life as a lunchroom in the police station, and it is now uh, multi-purpose. As you see, there are file cabinets in there. The intoxilized machine <coughs> is in there because over time we've moved uh, the, our booking area. Um, and we transport prisoners most of the time to, uh, to Cumberland County Direct, but there are times that we bring people back to the station and the intoxilizer is now in the lunchroom. So somebody could be uh, sitting there having lunch and somebody beside them is administering an intoxilizer to somebody under arrest and somebody else is coming down and getting files and so forth. The, uh, the one on the top right is my famous uh, gutter system in my office that uh, collects water that we've never been able to stop coming down through the wall. And um, we've had as much as recently I had uh, eight gallons, seven gallons uh, in one evening. Uh, the lower left is, uh, is in the fire department and that's the only conference area that they have. And this is where they go with plans with people that are coming in to talk about million dollar projects and so forth. And it's, as you can see, there's uh, hardly enough room to squeeze around the table, but it's also uh, abuts the, the uh, two restrooms. And um, if you were presenting a, a project of that scale, I'm not sure that that's 
what you would anticipate for an area to do it in. The, uh, the next one on the bottom is uh, Jim Butler, the inside of that famous uh, <laughs> wall made out of file cabinets. And this is where all the plans and things for, for those projects that we just talked about are, are stored. And again, you can see that they've just isn't, uh, it's not a good space. The next one on the top is it started its life. It's called mezzanine, and it, it, it was actually just an open area uh, for bulk storage. We ultimately had to put uh, all of our network racks up there and so forth because they used to be in dispatch and just got overwhelmed there, so we moved them up. And now we have uh, special enforcement folks. We have three special enforcement folks that are working out of that space as well. And it's an area that has no windows, no the constant hum of the of the network equipment and so forth. And the last one on the right is, uh, is our stairwell. And somebody comes in that uh, needs to get fingerprinted for bonding or a teacher or, or something like that. This is the only place that we have to, to do those fingerprints um, in the stairwell. And, and uh, I hate to say it, but all of these pictures and many, many more will show you code violations and so forth that we try to hold other folks responsible for. And it's So this next slide is, is just a graphic that kind of helps illustrate the changes over the years in the department, uh, and it also projects out with the best information that we have where we're going to be 25 years from now, which is um, the planning uh, envelope that we've designed the building for. So it starts out in 1968 just because that was the year that the police department actually moved from town hall to um, the fire station at, at Oak Hill. At that time, there were seven police officers. There were no full-time fire department personnel. The population of the town was less than 8,000. Uh, we had about 280 businesses, and uh, as you can see, the calls to service were relatively low back then. Four years later, uh, in 1972, is when we actually started our combined dispatch operations center. When uh, Elizabeth retired from putting the fire tones out from her home down at, uh, from work down at Newcomb store. Uh, at that time, in, in four years, the police department had actually doubled, so there were 14 uh, full-time personnel there. There still were no full-time fire personnel in 72 when that happened. Um, chief Harmon started as the first full-time chief the year after that. The population's pretty close and the numbers haven't changed much. Then we jumped 17 years to the time of the last addition, which was 1989. And as you can see in those 17 years, the uh, police department more than doubled in personnel. Uh, now we had six full-time fire personnel. The population had increased by a significant percentage. Um, the number of businesses had almost doubled. And calls to service are now really starting to, to climb. And then it's been 27 years. We used 2016 data just because when we put this together, that was the last stats that we had for a full year. Full-time police personnel is now up to 60. Um, fire personnel at 31. The population, as you can see, just short of 20,000. And the number of businesses is really skyrocketing, and that certainly has a demand on our services, as is noted in the calls for service, <coughs> which are now geometrically progressing each year. And then in 2041, which, like I said, is 25 years out, we've looked at the staffing plans, we've looked at population um, projections from SEDCO, who developed those numbers based on four or five different models, and we've got all the backup to go with it. Uh, this shows where we're going to be, and we've gone back 15 years to find out what our annual growth has been in calls for service. Then we average that 15 years, and that's what we've used for the projections going forward. So there's some science to how we came up with those calls for service numbers that I think you know will stand the test of time. And as you can see, we're going to be a much busier department um, into the future. Before we move on to the next one, I'd just like to um, point out that the numbers that we were talking about there are full-time staff, it's not the number of police officers. We don't have 60 police officers. That's uh, dispatchers, uh, admin, animal control, marine resource officers, the whole thing. Um, but in any case, I think um, when you look at some of the, the reason that we put this slide in is that there has been some talk about expansion and uh, trying to build something for our needs in the future. And, I just I was here in 1989 when when we moved into that into the facility that we're at now, 
and I can tell you that every seat in that building was taken the day we moved in and there was no ability to uh, do anything. There's very little expansion built into this building. I think uh, on the police side we have a lieutenant's office um, which doesn't currently exist. Um, we have some additional locker room space and so forth that, that doesn't exist. And we do have some room in the uh, mezzanine um, that he'll, he'll uh, definitely explain uh, as we go along for a little bit of expansion. But there's not a lot of um, expansion capability really built into the building. And it, it's just it's uh, interesting to look at this list of probably 20 things that uh, are close to it that uh, didn't exist in 1989 when we moved into the building, which do now. And I think you could probably cancel all those out and show another 20 that are going to be in place in the next 25 years as we move forward. So I think it is important that we at least uh, be able to, in a healthy way, meet our needs now with a little bit of expansion. So just quickly, some of the things that we didn't have in 1989, we didn't have a student intern living program, we didn't have a hazardous materials response, uh, community paramedic services, technical rescue, safety and compliance officer, EMS billing clerk, records clerk. We weren't doing Operation Hope. We weren't dealing with human trafficking issues. We weren't doing polygraphs. Uh, there was no cyber crime. Uh, we weren't doing video forensics. Uh, we didn't have community resource officers. We, we had one canine, but not a full-blown program like we have now. We didn't have school resource officers. Uh, we were doing some evidence processing, but certainly not to the level that we are now. Um, we weren't dealing with a lot of mental health services, and identity theft was something that was uh, not even on the horizon. So uh, those are all things that have happened in the last 27 years that we've been in the building, and I anticipate that in the next 25, we would have a whole new list. So we, uh, of course, the first tour we took was of the existing facility, and uh, we were just shocked going through. Um, not only was it very small in size, it, it just felt very cramped because there was so much activity going on within the building um, and it, it's seemingly people on top of one another. Um, I, you know, one of the most important things that uh, we had to do was find a site, but really the most important thing that we had to do day one was find a consultant to help guide us through this process. So we, um, we did an RFP um, out um, publicly advertised and we got nine responses, uh, six from across the state of Maine, some incorporating, uh, teaming up with out-of-state firms. We had one from New Hampshire and we also had two from Massachusetts. And uh, from day one, when the proposals came back in, we, we uh, had a subcommittee and we ranked the proposals that came in and uh, Donovan Sweeney, now known as Context Architecture, Jeff Shaw's firm, just immediately stood out. They, they had done their homework. Uh, they also had uh, local consultants on the team, uh, people that we knew, or some of us knew. And um, they also had done the Westbrook Public Safety Building, and they had also done the Brunswick uh, Police Station. Um, so they were standing out to us, but we interviewed four. And uh, Councilor Hayes took part in that, um, both chiefs, myself, uh, Greg Hanscom, who's a member of our committee, who is a retired police chief. Um, and um, we uh, had a day of interviews, talked to four firms, and in the end, we chose Context Architecture to, to join our team. And before I hand this off to uh, Jeff Shaw and introduce him, um, I, I will say, and I'd like Jeff to kind of come in and, and help me with this, is finding the site was the most important. It really kind of drove everything because once we could find a site that would serve the ISO requirements of, of basically being within a square mile of of uh, Oak Hill, uh, that uh, once we could determine where we were going to put the building, that helped spur everything else on that Jeff will go into. Uh, but this uh, process that, that Jeff put together, a matrix of 12 sites that we put under consideration using 16 
uh, factors, rating factors, uh, uh, led to the choice that we had, which is just south of this building that we're in right now. But with that, I'll, I'll introduce our consultant, Jeff Shaw, of Context Architecture. Thank you, Kevin. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it uh, was, was an exciting, um, thorough, uh, fast-paced process <laughs> for us. Um, but to be fair, we, we went in, I think, telling everybody in our interview that we were prepared to do a fast-paced project. That was the way it was proposed, and we were all for it. Um, understanding that we're prepared means that the town and the committee have to be prepared to make decisions at every meeting, so we cannot, you know, we can move forward and we can keep that pace up. And let me tell you, the folks that you have working on this committee were able to make those decisions in a knowledgeable and thorough way. And, uh, and have, we had everybody participating in all the meetings. So I, I do want to hand it to those, those folks and, and the community for putting together such a solid group. Um, the uh, the pro uh, drawings and, and renderings, <coughs> a bunch of numbers I'm going to uh, show you, are the end result of what we've been through. Um, but to give you a little taste of, of the process, um, we had um, many, many meetings. We looked at um, iterations of even the site matrix that Kevin just showed you um, to determine what were the right properties to look at. And ultimately, once we determined, every, I think we pretty much looked at every available piece of property within the ISO district. Um, what were the ultimate ratings we wanted to use? What, what, what were the appropriate rankings of those? So this wasn't something that we just spit out and the committee accepted. It was, I think, debated well. Um, then from that process, we went through the programming of the building and the space needs. I think we went to seven different iterations <coughs> of the space needs report, which thoroughly looked at every single space on a space by space, sheet by sheet basis, probably boring some people in these meetings, um, but that was an essential to get to a, a building cost that would represent the need, the actual need and not the wants, the desires, and anything else that you could find to stick in there. Uh, we have to balance, we've had a lot of discussions with Chief and I about this, balance that unknown future with the reality of the, co the, the um, capacity of the present to pay for it. And um, that's what we are charged with in every single one of these feasibility studies, and it's an interesting process to go through. So um, getting to a square footage number, which we got to 53,000 square feet, uh, honing it down from, I think we started at about 60 or close to that, and honing it down to that point, um, till we got to the point that the chiefs were saying, no more, no more space cut. This cannot have anything else cut out of the building where we're starting to affect operations and future abilities. Um, and then into the schematic design where we um, produced concepts, um, also looking at the mapping of the building, but also the, the levels of the building once this site was available. And we worked hand in hand with uh, the town's um, uh, landscape architect who's working on the um, campus master planning process to um, develop the site plan so that it was consistent with the vision that's already being conceived for this area. Uh, it would fit within that and the areas that we're taking from and then shaping that into something that everybody was comfortable with in terms of the final product. So that's the process. Um, so yeah, go to the first slide here. This is uh, the site plan, the final site plan that was chosen. Um, this locates the building in, in sort of red there, um, which is to the left of the town hall complex. Everything that's shown colored is conceived to be part of the project and part of the cost of the project. Everything that's toned out um, and from an aerial photograph is just the surrounding area. So on the right of the, of the image is the town hall, the L-shaped building with the upper parking lot <coughs> and Route 1 along the bottom of the image and the back parking lot lower parking lot in the back. Obviously this building encompasses a site that slopes fairly dramatically from the upper level down to sort of a midpoint closer to the car wash on uh, the bottom of our site. And um, dealing with that required us to develop a building that could be accessed on multiple floors. In, in, in a way it actually provided some advantages, which I'll talk about when I get to the plan. Um, 
But really, one of the first advantages is that we're able to take advantage of the TriGen system here um, at Town Hall. Because we're a reasonably close distance away, uh, we can then plug into it, essentially, for this building. Um, we can also expand the upper lot at Town Hall to serve both the public safety building and Town Hall. So that black area is the asphalt being expanded and the parking lot increased. And the entrance to, the town, to this new public safety building can be adjacent to Town Hall. So we're creating a, uh, an interesting interplay between the two buildings, but also something I think residents can refer to as sort of a campus center or, or a master plan there. Um, the left-hand side of the site is the parking lot there is meant for staff um, and in department vehicles. Um, the road new road, I should say, uh, which we're calling Campus Access Road, extending from Sawyer Road on the left up to the uh, Campus Access, Access Drive in the back, was um, uh, highly tuned to work in a specific way so that it allowed the fire apparatus to exit the site and go in multiple different directions, but also avoid the situations um, that the fire chief was talking about where apparatus have a hard time exiting onto Route 1. So this is a critical piece of infrastructure that allows the public safety personnel options and uh, fast response time. Um, it also is an amenity for the ultimate um, campus master plan and um, would enable some a little bit more development at that edge. If you look to the next one, this is a little bit more closer view. You can kind of see better what's going on here. But on the left of the site is where staff would enter the building at the lowest level of the building, also where apparatus would exit the building. We have what's called a dual response apparatus room where the left hand facing uh, traffic is called the primary response. And then there's rear facing bays, which is the uh, reserve response or less use vehicles um, would have access to be able to drive out. This Arrangement allows for very little um, complications in arranging vehicles within the apparatus bay. It also allows for faster response of um, particular vehicles that aren't always accessed as easily. Um, there's also a small 10 parking space lot in the very back, which can be used by call responding um, and staff uh, vehicles. We had numerous conversations with our group as well as other town uh, staff about the design of the site and the amenities that were there, um, things like snow storage, plowing, um, stormwater, a whole range of things that have been hotly debated and integrated. And at this level of a master plan, it's interesting to see. It's slightly unusual to get to that level of detail. The last thing I want to mention is that at the staff entrance on the left, currently there's um, a plan to have uh, a cover area for emergency vehicles, particularly cruisers, so that they can be under cover in inclement weather, particularly snow, ice, those sorts of situations where they might be inside writing a report and have to leave the, the station in a hurry and don't have the time really in an emergency to spend scraping down a vehicle that's iced over. Um, so this is an area they can leave those vehicles under cover. And then um, there's a small area for uh, kennel panel at the end of that. Uh, you'll see more of that in the rendering. The floor plans I won't go into in exhaustive detail. They are colored and coded so you can see the red is for fire, the blue is police, the purple is shared space, and when we get to it the green will be uh, public spaces. Um, primarily the first level is for uh, police detention booking area, which is a small piece of it, evidence and evidence garages, the locker rooms for both departments, uh, for, for the police department, should say, and the fitness room for both departments, and fire apparatus and apparatus support spaces, storage and other support spaces like the turnout here. And in the plan on the right, uh, this is where the advantage of building in a site that has a large increase in, in elevation <coughs> is that we're able to slide in what, what we're calling a mezzanine. Uh, into the middle of this where um, where the uh, we have a couple things going on here. One, we're able to put the mechanical spaces 
uh, boiler rooms, uh, electrical rooms, that sort of thing, and what's called the network operations center in this floor, um, which allows the building to be a smaller footprint. And we're all also able to provide open space in the generally in the apparatus area, um, where it's shown on the, the top of this thing up here. Uh, this red space is all open space for the fire department, um, and this is all open space for the police department, and that is intended to do a couple of things. Um, one is to provide current, you know, when they move in, current space for them to do some training that's there. It's just open space that can do confined space rescue and some other types of training. But in the future, if there are programs that are developed that need to be housed in this building, these spaces can be conserved as outlets for that to happen without having to build expensive additions to the building. Um, these spaces can simply just be fit out and reused. The plan on the left is the main floor and the floor you would enter from the upper parking lot at Town Hall. So obviously there we have the green spaces which are the public, <coughs> public accessible spaces. So you walk in to a lobby, several public bathrooms, mm -hmm. as well as a training room large meeting room that can be subdivided uh, and used simultaneously by both departments, which also doubles as an emergency operations center for the town. The purple space is the combined uh, dispatch area and the associated spaces with that. The red is all of the fire dormitory and living space, and the blue at the far end of the building is all of the patrol areas for the police department, so located very close to where their cruisers would be. In the second floor, um, because there's slightly less space needed uh, on this second floor, um, but the building is, you know, uh, it does have two ends to it, we have fire and police administration on the right with shared spaces that are um, mainly administration and conference room spaces, as well as the uh, staff break room that are shared by both departments. And then on the left, we have the detectives area investigation. We did plan for the uh, possibility in the future that the area that's shown um, in a rectangle here um, can potentially, or if the, the town desires, but the building would be designed for that space to be built up into floor area. So in the future, if there was a project or a need for additional space, the structure would be there, uh, infrastructure would be there to build out if you needed to. So, one of the things that was stressed throughout this project is don't leave the, the town hamstrung in the future if something were to come up that we couldn't foresee. And so that would, that would cost something to do it, at least it would be less cost than, and it would fit better into the overall uh, scheme of the building. Um, so that's the layout of the building. And that expansion capability, I not to interrupt, is actually designed into each floor. So in the basement level, we designed the site plan so that we could add another bay onto the apparatus bay if we needed to on the north end of the facility. On the first floor, um, where the dormitories are, the, the structure will be made so we could add additional dormitories. Yeah, we, could, we could build out into this area here. As well as the section that Jeff talked about on the second. <coughs> right. So uh, looking at what the building might look like, this is you know a concept uh, artist rendering. This is the view looking from the Town Hall Municipal parking lot and the Town Hall being on the right um, and then the public safety, the proposed public safety building being on the left. Um, you'll note we've tried to stress using similar types of materials so we're using a brick masonry uh, facade with um, hipped or I should say gabled metal roofing um, with a similar type of entry um, symmetry you also note that this rendering shows the communications tower, which will be needed in this uh, facility, and the location is currently planned um, here because it actually makes a very um, easy, accessible connection to the network operations room. The other reason it's here is because every square foot of the lower part of the site is necessary for um, operations of the fire department and for the future potential future expansion that she thoroughly mentioned. Um, we just couldn't find a space to locate it that wouldn't detract from the operation of the building. Um, the other key piece is that the higher we place the tower, the less power we have to buy. So 
so that extra 10 feet is money. The view looking from Route 1, looking northeast of Route 1, shows you um, the, the highest extent of the building, um, although it should be noted that buildings surrounding this are potentially even higher, uh, five stories, um, where only essentially four stories or three plus that mezzanine. Um, this is from the staff entrance, and you can see the canopy over the cruisers there. Uh, just a conceptual look at the building, breaking it into two masses with these two gabled roofed and facing Main Street starts to break down what could be perceived as a large building into more discrete elements and helps to make um, this one feel a little bit better than just building giant boxes. And where this sits on Route 1, if you were to look to your right, you'd have Scarborough Commons. Yeah. And, you know, that's a four-story building across the street. It really kind of catches your eye. The last rendering uh, is the view from the Memorial Park, which shows mainly the, the more service aspects of the building, but it's the apparatus phase. Um, has been discussed in our meetings at length. This building has no back, has no um, backyard that you can hide the, the dirty, messy stuff that you don't want people to see. It has to be designed for somebody to, in the public to be able to look at it from every different angle. Um, so we've tried to put some attention everywhere where it's needed. I, I had that incorrect. It's Bessie Commons across the street, the senior yeah. housing <laughs> complex, the old Bessie school. So getting into the budget, and this is the last slide before we can turn it over to your questions. Um, we looked very carefully uh, throughout the process at the budget um, using cost per square foot numbers that are tuned to this area and the type of building that this is. So. Throughout the process, we were paying attention. Um, when it came to the schematic design, we actually had an independent cost estimator provide a line-by-line -line breakdown over the entire project, um, the multi-page document. Um, and we actually discussed that multi-line document in our meetings multiple times, as well as the committee had a, a separate internal group also reviewing those, filled with professionals that could analyze those line items. and. Um, I think in consultation, everybody came up with areas to cut from the initial budget that was done that represent the final budget that you see here, which really honed in on what we're building the building out of is appropriate to the type of building we're making. The things we're putting in it is appropriate to the expectations of the town of Scarborough in terms of the level of finishes going into the building. Um, and the technology the infrastructure and the way the building is being conceived is appropriate to addressing what's needed now and into the future, especially things like trying into the tri gym and developing the campus access road. It's all here in these numbers. So quickly, construction costs about 17 million, all the other necessary costs to build the project, um, design and build the project about 2.8, and that contingency uh, which represents some hedge against risk at 1.7, so the total is 21.5 at this point. And this is you know, our, our best guess, most probable estimate of the future cost of the building. And it's interesting, too, uh, to take a look at the study that was done in 2007, 2008. Now, that called for a 43,000 square foot building 10 years ago. Uh, we have a 53,000 square foot building. That project had $10.4 million in construction costs, but it didn't include a road. It didn't include the, the network of roads to come in and out of the facility. So comparatively, we're at 53,000 square feet now and a $17 million budget that includes the road system that are required. Um, the other interesting point, of, point to note is um, the soft costs to develop the project in 2008 with $2.4 million. We're at 2.8 10 years later. So there's really been a lot of efficiencies brought in our approach, and, and some of that, as Jeff alluded to, is because we've gone to a level of detail that's a little higher than what you would typically see in a, in a schematic level design. Um, you also, add, uh, Peter? I was, was going to say, Kevin, when we talked about the, the last piece, you talked about the fi finish. Yeah. I think maybe can you describe sort of how we got to the what we're calling the Chevy? I mean, it was, it was, I think it's important for the audience to hear how we kind of struggled with what's the right 
didn't finish the building. Absolutely, very much so. We have reiterated and asked Jeff to give us a medium level of finish, durability and low maintenance, as opposed to high-end flooring and finishes. And Jeff has really kind of scrubbed his approach. Yeah, we've done a lot of these types of buildings, so we're no stranger to that request. And that's generally baked into our approach. But it's always interesting to see where communities land for certain things. So we had some options in the cost estimate, and based on feedback from the small working group that was developed within the committee, as well as the committee as a whole, certain things were preferable over other things. Floor finishes being durable sheet goods or durable DCT type products over more luxury stuff. When it comes to the exterior of the building, there was some sensitivity, particularly to durability, but also to aesthetics. We didn't want to make an ugly building or a big box building that didn't look good or appropriate next to the town hall. But, for instance, the lower level of the building, we initially conceived of it may be a stone versus masonry, so brick masonry, so that maybe you have that basement or lower level look that you see oftentimes where buildings or barns are put into the side of a hill. And feedback we got, one of our suggestions was that that could be swapped out for a rusticated concrete masonry unit, which in the view you're looking at from Route 1, won't look that much different from stone. So that was a trade-off made, and money was saved at this point in the process. And as Kevin said, you don't usually get to these types of levels of decision until you're well into design. So the fact that the committee was going to that level on every line item, I think we're scrubbing things like the mirrors out of the fitness room. So there was a lot of stuff they paid attention to so that we were avoiding the questions that will come later. What is really within this budget, I think, is very well vetted. And there are two items that I just want to mention that are included in the budget and were subject to some real scrutiny. One was originally the budget did not have radiant heated floors in the apparatus base. And Bruce Bell, who is a member of our committee and has been a firefighter for well over 40 years, stated the case that we're protecting equipment that is $750 to $1 million per piece, the fire trucks themselves, and really kind of built the case that the better that we preserve that equipment, the longer life we're going to get on that equipment. So for the $80,000 that it costs to put a radiant floor into the building, we all looked at each other and said, this is money well spent, and we'll get a return on that. The other item, and Rick Meinking really kind of banged the drum quite loudly on, was the fact that we want to take advantage of the Trigen, and that in fact adding load to the Trigen will make it more cost effective because it's going to run at optimum capability. So we have kept that number in our price, in our estimate, to really kind of fully take advantage of the Trigen itself. So those are just two examples of things that we have in the budget that we really feel quite strongly about. Your charge also asked us to consider the existing facility, the reuse versus the sale of the facility. We also want you to know that amongst the 12 sites that were under consideration was the existing site. It did not rate highly. When we had a subcommittee of which Judy Roy, myself, and Karen Martin from SEDCO were members of, we studied what could we do with the existing building. One of the, in our opinion, for police use, it has lived a good life. We looked at the property and Angela Blanchett dropped down in the shaded, a 30,000 square foot building, and in the full rectangle, a 41,000 square foot building that would be the typical sizes for a community center. Our 
analysis showed us that we would not have enough parking for a community center in either one of those sizes. Uh, so we really kind of moved on from there. And we took it um, to talk about what do we do about reuse or sale of the building. Um, uh, we uh, went to a real estate consultant. We have walked three developers through the building to evaluate it and the uh, feeling of our committee is, is that the sale is the highest and best use uh, for this property. We would recommend using the proceeds uh, from the sale and the public serv uh, safety building reserve funds to reduce the total bond amount required for a new facility. There is interest in our building on the part of developers who have a history in the Portland area of redeveloping, uh, redeveloping similar type masonry block buildings. Um, one other thing our committee would like to bring to your attention is uh, we have voted unanimously to utilize construction management at risk as the delivery method for this project. That's part of the reason we were able to reduce the soft costs by almost $350,000. We feel that, uh, number one, most of the new buildings, that, new public safety buildings that have gone up in the last 10 years in the state of Maine have been delivered utilizing construction management at risk as the delivery method. Yes. Can, can you just define that for the general public? Uh, construction manager at risk is where you bring on a construction manager based on qualifications, past experience, team, and the price of their services. But you bring them on at an early part of design. Actually, a construction manager would be the first move that the uh, town would make after getting an architect right at that same time you want to bring a construction manager on to take advantage of their, you know, getting them on the same side of the table to develop, fully develop the project. Do you know if that was a similar approach that was taken at Wentworth, or is it? Uh, no, at Wentworth it wasn't. <coughs> okay. it, it, okay. it wasn't. That was a okay. that was a bid project. Okay. Um, the high school expansion was done as construction management, as was Westbrook Public Safety Building, Gorham Public Safety Building, Saco Fire Department, um, Brunswick Police Department. It, it, it's really been a pretty common. Bangor used it as well. And the thing that people need to remember too is when you're building a police station or a fire department um, or a, a government building, it's a lot different than building a regular building, regular quote unquote building. Um, it's different than building a town hall because of the, the all of the equipment and things that they have, the ammunition that needs to be stored, um, the security measures that they need. So bringing on someone at that level is going to save so much time and energy on the flip side of things. That was my that's my opinion. Uh, that's a that's a great way to describe it, Kate. It also eliminates a lot of conflict. That that is the best part of it in my mind because you're all working on the same side of the table instead of the architect designing something and then bidding it out and then at the end of the day there's always conflict in those types of relationship. This serves to mitigate a lot of that right up front. And it is our opinion as a committee that uh, this project will get strong interest in the construction community and we would be able to have a say on who, not only the company that's going to build it, but who at that company would be building our project. Um, timing is the uh, third item that I want to uh, mention. Um, our committee, again, unanimously feels that due to the obvious need for this building, combination with the low interest rates that are currently out there and future cost escalations that we anticipate that we would strongly recommend, let's get this out to the voters and let the voters decide whether you know, we want to move forward with the project, but we really feel it should be on the ballot as soon as possible. Um, finally, um, we <laughs> took with, uh, with uh, some some bit of sadness that uh, our committee's charge ends with our report to you tonight. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, feel that we have uh, delivered on the charge that you gave us and we've delivered you the deliverables that you asked us to deliver. We uh, voted unanimously last week 
at our final meeting that if the council would want us to continue as a committee during the election process for the referendum or if, if, if successful with the actual building of the project, uh, we unanimously voted that we would stay on and would act uh, to try to get this thing passed and then to try to finish this project and get it in the ground. So we really ask if you could take that uh, very seriously on our account. I think almost everyone is here tonight from the committee. And uh, we thank you very much. Uh, it's been a real honor. Uh, I'm speaking for everyone on the committee. It's been a real honor to serve the town in this capacity. Uh, we have had a ball. And when we thought about it at that first meeting, we said, how are we ever going to get to July 19th? Well, here we are. 20, 20 meetings later, and uh, we're very proud of the product that we've delivered you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I think that speaks to Kevin's leadership, and I think it's really important that the council knows and the town knows that this would not have been possible without what you put into it personally, Kevin. I know the committee was a strong committee. Tom, you guys put together an incredible, um, knowledgeable committee, but it wouldn't have happened without you. And um, I think everybody owes you a lot. Thank you, Thank committee. You. We had a great committee. The, great I don't know who put it together, but we um, really had a great cross section of people who live here in town that, that really brought a lot to the table. Excellent. Any questions or comments from council? Just a couple, couple of questions, and, and I, I very much respect the, the makeup of the committee. I think you guys did some great work. Um, just a couple kind of basic questions from, from me as the kind of an outsider coming in a little bit. Um, what, what is the design life cycle of the building? Are we talking 50 years, 40 years? Um, I, I know the, ch the chief projections were out like another 25 years, I think it was, or something like that. What are we, what are we anticipating for the lifespan of the building? Just from a design standpoint. Yeah, as, as so it currently exists. That's an interesting question. <coughs> We've prepared the program and the size of the building for what we can think might happen in the next 25 years. But obviously, as we've mentioned, we want to prepare it to do more than that. The products and the way we're building this building, this building is going to be uh, 75, 75 years built. Now, the actual mechanical equipment in that gets about 15 to 20 years. So there will be cycles where maintenance and, and uh, replacement of capital will have to be invested into the, the building, but the structure, the envelope of the building, it, it is a durable, long-term asset to the community, and that, that was the intention all along. Okay. Um, was it explored to separate out police and fire and have separate facilities, or has it kind of been that the motion all along is that we should stay together? I know there's a lot of efficiencies we get by keeping everybody together, but was that an option to look at having separate standalone you know, facilities? I, uh, Chris, out of the gates, um, it was something that I questioned. But you know, when you get when you get into the history of our department, um, and not to disparage any of our, our our neighboring communities, but some communities it was done uh, for political expediency to combine the the departments. In Scarborough, the, the departments have been combined for 45 years, and it's just part of the culture. And, and both uh, Chief Thurlow and Chief Moulton are are really kind of products of that culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think it will live well past them as opposed <coughs> to other communities where it was more personality driven and, and, and politically driven to have public safety. We, we did look at it in detail and, and from not only those issues but from the maintaining and, and operational costs of two separate facilities and the fact that we work together on such a daily basis that it it just doesn't make an awful lot of sense. With Jeff's help, we've been able to incorporate all of those uh, purplish colored spaces, our shared spaces, that you would have to essentially duplicate in two different buildings. So it, it really has been a very cost-effective solution as well as an operationally efficient operation. So, la sorry, last one here is, um, I know we haven't done traffic studies and everything else. I, 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 I'd like to hear a little bit more detail in the planning phases of that connector loop um, and the traffic flow and studies through there. My only concern is that that's, that gets plugged up quite a bit at least two times a day during, during schools, when school's in session. 
And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not questioning the layout of the design, but I'd really like to see some emphasis on traffic planning and some maybe some mechanisms in place to to either alleviate that congestion somehow or find a way to make sure that vehicles can get through there quickly and expeditiously or an alternative out or something like that. So um, I think from a conceptual standpoint, it's great. Um, I think maybe looking at that a little bit more detail as the, as the plan moves forward, I, I certainly would like to see that. I, I, and I think with time and with a little more detail given to you, um, uh, the Angela Blanchett from the town, um, Terry Dewan Associates and uh, Sebago Technics, who was context uh, consultant um, locally, along with Ellen White from the project team. They really studied the the school end of the project, and uh, I we really felt it was an improvement over what's there now. Yeah, I should note that um, that road, or a portion of it, once you get to the apparatus bay, is one way up to Sawyer Road, so you won't have traffic trying to work their way back up and working against public safety traffic that's coming out. That was a key concept. And the primary response is, is to Sawyer Road. Yeah. There is the option if we need to go up Memorial, but that isn't typically the response only us we're going to the schools. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah just a little, like, a little more explanation of that because I know, yeah. that, you know, you know, uh, uh, Experiencing that on a regular basis, people have a hard time turning down there now, and I can imagine with the lights going off and having to get emergency vehicles through there too, is could be challenging for sure. So, given time, um, oh, sorry, I don't know who was first. Ladies first, Kate. I think mine's quick. Um, so, as much as I would love a community center and a pool, I understand why you came to the conclusion that you did. I kind of figured the parking was going to be an issue. Um, but I'm curious to know if you jo uh, threw around numbers, what, what, you know, even a range of what you would expect to get from the sale of that building and what voters could expect to potentially offset that bond. Well, that, uh, that is still being, uh, being finalized or considered. Uh, I think it's reasonable to say that it's somewhere in the uh, 1.5 to 1.8 for the property, um, if it were just a straight property sale, but <coughs> maybe a little more than that if it included the building. Um, but again, uh, that's before you actually get a proposal from someone. But I, I think the, the greatest indicator we had was that three people showed interest. Comment on it. I really applaud the willingness of the committee to continue. I, I, three cheers to that. It's a lot of work, week after week, uh, showing up at these meetings. Uh, as far as the economy of the proposal, can you give us a comparison to your square foot cost to what other buildings in recent years have been built uh, in the region? Um, the, the most recent example, and it was of a context uh, architecture building in Sharon, Massachusetts, um, a 40, roughly 41,000 square foot combined public safety building came in at 17.7 million in 2016. Um, locally, um, the, the, the most recent of comparable size uh, was in 2013, the the police department, police only in Brunswick, designed by context, uh, came in uh, 23, excuse me, 20,000 square feet at $4.6 million. Um, and in Saco, uh, the fire station built right at the end of the recession, um, 23,000 square foot building that came in at $6 million. Um, I think the, as you know, I work in the construction industry, the, the escalation in in construction costs in the last two years has just been incredible, both on the material side and also on the manpower side. Um, and it's projected to continue to increase significantly. Yeah, it has. If we delay, we're going to see an expectation of substantially higher costs? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we, go, before we even started this project, we asked our cost estimator, what would you say, roughly, this region, this time, Main public safety buildings, cost per square foot. And he said roughly $300 per square foot. We're roughly hit right now about $300 per square foot. So we're about coming out of this process, we're about kind of where we thought we would be in, in the range of what he's seen for our types of buildings like this. So 
So rating it good, better, best, where, where is this building's quality? I think it's in the, the better category to, to, to best. Um, it depends on what your criteria is. If you want a durable, long-lived building, this is in the best category. If you're looking for fancy finishes, that's your quality of best, then we're not there. But <laughs> okay, that answers my question. Thank you. Can I say real quick? Um, I just wanted to say, I know we're going to discuss this at our meeting tonight about whether or not we keep this committee, um, but I don't know if they'll all still be here. I would uh, just encourage this council to hang on to this committee for as long as they're willing to give up their time. Um, it's an incredibly gifted, um, committed group of people. And I've seen lots of committees and lots of groups of people, and I haven't witnessed one like this in six years. So these are people that are really invested in this building, and I think if you um, can hang on to them, I think it's really wise to do that. Thank you. And with that, we'll close the workshop and open up our regular meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you, everyone. Um, this is the regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council on Wednesday, July 19th. 
um, which uh, is immediately followed. We just completed a workshop, so we are starting uh, fresh. And if we could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call, please. Councilor Donovan? Here. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Chiazzo? Here. Chairman Baybine? Here. And uh, next item is any general public comments. This is an opportunity for um, any citizen or visitor that would like to get up and speak. You have three minutes. If you could please state your name and uh, your address in town. I'm Susan Hamill, and I live on Bay Street in Pine Point. And um, I'd like to just say that uh, no news is not necessarily good news. I thought about whether or not I'd come to speak tonight, and um, I wasn't going to come and speak. But someone reminded me that the council might assume that just because a viewpoint isn't voiced, everything is fine. So I'm here to say that everything is not fine. I'm voting no on the school budget, and there are a lot of us are voting no. And we are not going away. We don't want to be bullied. We don't want to be name called or shamed. We don't agree that the token cut to the budget was enough. And we think a 3% increase in taxes year after year is, not, is too much and is not sustainable. Anybody else that would like to get up and speak? Nancy Kroll, Director of the Scarborough Public Library. I was waiting to see if there were others first before I um, stood here. Um, exciting news I wanted to share. I'm actually on vacation this week, so <laughs> I'm not taking any media after this. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to just share the fact that the library has joined with four neighboring communities to begin a shared borrowers card initiative. Mm -hmm. This is the first in the state. We're very, very excited about it. It means that you can take your Scarborough Public Library card to the Thomas Memorial Library in Cape Elizabeth, the South Portland Public Library, the Baxter Library in Gorham, or the Walker Library in Westbrook, mm -hmm. and use your library card, your Scarborough card, there. Likewise, members of those community libraries can come to Scarborough and use our library with that local library card. Mm -hmm. It's possible because we all belong to the Minerva Shared um, Online System, and it's been an idea we've talked about for many, many years, and we finally made it happen. We have had wonderful response from the public, but I just want to let you all know that we are once again leading the state and very proud to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Great news. Thank That's you. Awesome. Evening. Ben Howard, uh, Seven Windsor Pines. Um, I'd just kind of like to echo those points. Uh, I myself have been thinking a long time about um, sort of how the meeting went two weeks ago. Uh, I chose not to get up and speak because I felt that, yes, the budget was cut. That is what I asked for in a vote. It wasn't to the point that I wanted to, but at least there was an effort made. After getting to the point where public comments were over and the amendment process started, um, things kind of got crazy, um, in, in my opinion. It's, I wonder if there can be a change to that um, so we can see as a public maybe the amendments beforehand. I know you can amend the moment of. But one of those amendments was pretty big, um, just to jump on last second and no one from the town to have any words to say about it is, is kind of unfair. But to echo that final point, to have sat through both meetings, both the town council and the school board, um, I voted no and I sat here and listened as many councillors and school board members shamed those who voted no for whatever reason it may be many people blaming the signs may be misinformation. Every person that came out and voted, whether it be just because they saw those signs, had a reason why they voted no, and they should not be just shamed for the way that they voted. It reminded me of times in high school when I thought I worked really hard on a paper and a teacher would give me a C and they would say, and I would look at it and I would go, how could you? I worked so hard on that. But the teacher was able to see maybe I could do more, I could do better. And I think that's a better way to look at it and realize that, yes, maybe you did work really hard on the budget and you spent a long, long time on it and you cut every dollar you could, 
but the townspeople didn't, they think you can do better. Um, I would really hope that in the future we can get away from the idea of shaming and blaming it and saying, how could they do this? How could you do that? Um, and just say, okay, guess what? We didn't pass the budget. We need to move forward here and get back to work. Um, because shaming and stuff just makes people angrier and come back out and gets up and says, uh, gets up and says more things. So thank you. Larry Harwell, 9 Puritan Drive. Good evening. I'm sp speaking on behalf of myself, represent no group other than a member of Smart Taxes. I'd like to say a few things about the upcoming school budget. But first, a few updates. Last month, Scarborough High was ra ranked by U.S. News and World Report as the sixth best high school in Maine. And if you don't count the state-funded STEM schools, Scarborough was ranked fifth best in Maine. Our superintendent, uh, administrators and all of us citizens of the town should be proud of that. As a layperson, I can only say this does not sound like a school lacking in resources. As part of an active democratic process, signs have been placed around town stating different viewpoints on the July 25th school validation vote. I'm sad to say at least four of the vote no signs have been stolen. Not only is this not how democracy works, I suspect it violates a state law. Today I was informed that the vote yes flyers, not mailings but flyers, were placed in residents' mailboxes. As any good citizen knows, this is illegal and a violation of federal law. Now on to what I came here to talk about. Our elected officials like to misdirect the voters on the school budget by talking exclusively about the town's overall mill rate, estimated recently at 3% which combines the municipal and school budgets. Voters only vote on the school budget. Some elected officials like to say you cannot break out the school budget. Wrong. Every town in Maine has a separate municipal budget and school budget. The public vote is simply on how much in local tax dollars are to be raised for schools. The signs reading vote, no, 6.8 simply are pointing out the fact taxpayers are being asked to contribute 6.8% more in tax dollars this year. This number comes from the school department, not me. A myth that we have here in town, the school budget gets cut every year. This is not remotely true. In 2011, the budget was $35 million. The one we're asked to approve now is $47 million. That's $12 million, a 33% increase since 2011. Uh, the so-called little three and 5% annual increases have grown this budget, like I say, by 33%. This year, the so-called budget cuts will leave the schools with a little over $1.3 million more than they had last year. Yes, the schools will be getting $1.3 million more than last year, even though it's been presented otherwise. I wish our elected officials would provide the kind of information that would allow voters to make informed decisions. If you're interested in knowing more about this important issue, go to the website smarttaxes.com. Yes, smartaxis.com has the numbers the municipal and school budgets produce, but in a form that you can understand. Thank you for your time. Anyone else? Good evening. My name is Courtney Reeves, and I'm here. Um, I live in Sawgrass Drive, and I'm here to represent myself, my family, and the neighborhood of Sawgrass Drive. Um, I want to bring up the topic of medical marijuana and growing. Um, during harvesting, se harvesting season in September and October, um, the plants, which uh, medical marijuana can have up to 30 mature plants, emit a lot of odor into the air. On a quarter of an acre of plot, this odor comes right over to my fence and into my home. Um, so that's concern number one. Concern number two is fencing. I'm not clear that Scarborough's had um, an ordinance around the fencing, how the fencing should appear, what it should look like, um, also around locking and safety. Um, I've seen animals and there's um, young children close by that can go in and out of the area where this, this farm, this pot farm is, which is concerning. Proximity to schools, um, this neighborhood is very close to schools where um, marijuana is not legal up to a certain age, um, and bus stops. And so there's a lot of things to consider during this topic. Um, I brought it up in the last town council meeting. After talking to Bill and to Tom, I'm not clear on 
where this is headed with all of these issues. So I wanted to bring it up again tonight so it got a little bit more ears and see if we can have a clear path on what our next steps are. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Mo Erickson. I live at 288 Pine Point Road. And um, to reiterate what a couple of people talked about earlier, you know, I know that the town council prides itself on having decorum and civility amongst each other and amongst their audience. And when I saw the video of the meeting last, uh, last month and heard some people um, chastise the smart taxes and ridicule them and say that they were smart Alex, I thought, boy, that's the pot calling the kettle black. Um, you know, so I, I think that the smart taxes or, or any group, I don't, I don't think that the council should browbeat them or ridicule them when um, it's their time to speak at the end of a meeting, as I saw on the video. And I also saw the, um, I think she's the head of the school board, shaming the public that we didn't pass this vote. And shame on her for, for saying that about the general public. Not everyone in, in Scarborough can afford a, a yearly 3% raise, as you know. I've complained about it for the last eight years. More raises, more raises. And it's just time to stop. But I don't think the town council, or the, certainly the school board, is listening to the public. They voted no that last time. I can only hope they vote again. But really, the moral of this, what I'm, what I'm really getting at today is, I think you should respect the town and what they say, how they say it, and their actions that they take, and you should not ridicule them. Thank you. Anyone else? Anybody want to speak? Not seeing any, we'll close the public comments. Thank you, everyone. Um, and moving on to item number five is approval of minutes for June 21st, June 28th, and July 5th. Um, meetings, is there a motion? Move approval. Second. And any edits, uh, questions, or clarifications for the clerk? Not seeing any, all in favor. And that is unanimous, thank you. Adjustments to the agenda, we do have one item that we will be adding to the agenda. It will be order number 17-069, an act on the request from the police department to accept the community development block grant, or CDBG, in the amount of $33,000 for Operation Hope which the town council supported submission of the grant application at a February 15th meeting. So we will put that under new business at the end. Moving on to order number 17-056. It is a seven o'clock public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendment to chapter 405, the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance definition of a golf course that's been presented to us by the planning department. Um, would the manager like to, before we had a public comment, would you like to provide an overview of what this is? Um, I certainly can. I believe Karen Martin Karen said yeah. is here, and she actually is the one that brought this matter forward to the Long Range Planning. So if you mm -hmm. permit, she can speak to it. Good evening, Karen Martin with the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation. This amendment before you tonight actually does an amendment to uh, the definition of golf courses. And this came about because of a request uh, by a local golf course who was interested in having a an apartment, a dwelling unit, in an existing building on the property that would allow for a course manager to um, live in the apartment and um, perform both security and management of the golf course on a 24-hour basis. And when we looked at the different options, um, we felt like the easiest way and the, the most efficient way to allow uh, something like that to happen was to go ahead and amend the definition of the golf course. So the current definition already um, lists out several different types of buildings that can be on the golf course. You can have one that's storage, you can have a clubhouse, you can have other types of units. We simply have added a, a, uh, an additional building that can take place so that you can have in, in a, an accessory unit you can, uh, and an, in an accessory building, you can actually have a dwelling unit. Um, so this is a pretty straightforward uh, change in the definition of the use. Um, there's no zone change to uh, the ordinance. It's merely an uh, insertion of a, a, a phrase within the definition of the golf course. And again, part of the reason this is required 
um, is because oddly the golf course as existing could put a dwelling unit, a standalone single family unit, but they couldn't put one um, in an existing building. And that's really what this, this amendment is doing. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, with that, um, is there any public comment? Anybody that would like to speak? I'm not seeing any, we'll close the public comment. And if I could have a motion from the council. So moved. Second. And comments or questions from council? Council Chiazzo. <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, Long Range did look at this, and I don't think it's changed any since first reading. Uh, so uh, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't move this forward. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing any. Uh, moving the question, all in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you. Order number 17-064. 17064 is a 7 o'clock public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license from James Morandi, doing business as Fairhaven Dunes, located at 3 East Grand Avenue. If I could just make a comment, I yes. would request that this be tabled time. They didn't uh, put the proper notice in the paper, which is required. So okay. I'd like to see it tabled to the April 16th. I mean, August, August. 16th, hmm. sorry. <laughs> if there's no objection from the public for public comment, I'd just like to entertain a motion to table and move it to that, uh, what was the date? August, August 16th. August 16th, so moved. Second. Second. Thank, Thank you. you. All in favor of tabling it? That's unanimous. Thank you. Moving on to resolution 17-004, act on the request to extend the duties of the ad hoc public safety complex building committee to after the November elections as recommended by the town manager. And, and uh, if I could just introduce the matter, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, I appreciate that this might be a bit presumptuous and that the council will not be making any final decisions at this meeting. Um, I do anticipate it being on your next agenda to discuss the timing of uh, bringing this matter out to the voters. Uh, but I did have a, a, a fair warning, if you will, that the committee was interested in, in extending their uh, time and effort toward this cause. And so I, I put it on your agenda. I don't think it would do any harm if you're not comfortable voting tonight to table it to your next meeting and pair it up with that decision, that discussion. Uh, but having said that, my hunch is that this building is inevitable, whether it's this, this November or next June. Uh, we have a group of capable, willing, and able residents to, to keep working. So I thought I'd put it in front of you and perhaps you'll consider it tonight. And with that, is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on the resolution? Not seeing any. Uh, what is the will of the council? So moved. moved. Second. Second. Any comments or questions? Councilor uh, Faith, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I just echo some of the earlier comments by, by Council St. Clair. I, I had the honor of also participating with this group. There are, this is a great group of individuals that are highly committed to this, very, very talented. I, I highly recommend that we consider continuing this group. I think it just only adds tremendous value to the project. So it's been a great process. So that's, that's my two cents worth, I guess. Councilor Chiazzo? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm equally uh, impressed with the uh, professionalism and the uh, efficiency and the, and the ethic and the will of the group to really roll their sleeves up and get involved in their commitment to the project. So uh, I think November is a very aggressive time frame, and I think uh, that will require an all-hands-on-deck approach if we're going to get that moved forward. So I certainly would support keeping them on as long as they're willing to serve. Councilor. And I was going to echo that a little bit in that I, I think there's probably no one else poised better to champion the mm -hmm. cause than them because they have all the background. But I do also see value sometimes in adding new eyes. So I don't know if there is room for one or two additions to the committee, if they're willing to entertain that idea, or if there's already built into their meetings uh, opportunity for public. I don't, you know, some, meet, some committee meetings are more formal than others, and some are less formal where there's a lot of interaction between the public and a committee. So if it's a very open format already, then I think it would be fine. If it's very formal, it might be a nice idea to uh, open up to have a couple of fresh eyes. Uh, did, I wouldn't take anyone away, but maybe add. Great. How's it Claire? Um, I, it's a large group, so I would be, um, I was nervous in the beginning at the size of it, but when we looked at the names of people that uh, had submitted, that was the, the range of skills, um, we didn't want to turn anybody away because just because of the experience. Um, so I'd be a little bit hesitant to add anybody to it. Their meetings are open. People can attend. Um, they can submit 
questions. Kevin's amazing at getting back to people. Um, I'm very comfortable with Kevin um, being able to delegate, you know, moving forward, how he wants to establish subcommittees for different projects and things like that. I think he has um, the skills and the knowledge to be able to do that. So I have a real comfort level with, with, ta with tasking him with that if he wants to continue in the role that he's in. Um, I would think I think that they should probably do that soon so that they can and my, for me I'd like to see them have one more meeting see what the commitment level is from everybody who's on that committee and then maybe have Kevin come back to us with his numbers and then we go from there to determine do we want to open this up and add more people and get maybe you know Kevin and maybe one or two other people from the committee or the chief's recommendations from there um, it's a large project so the numbers that we have right now are, are, are needed, um, but my comfort level would be for Kevin to go back to his group and um, ask them, make sure that they are really in it to stick with it through for another year or so, um, and then have Kevin come back and report to us and let us know what the consensus is, and then I think we can sort of build on it from there. Any other comments? Just like, so I like the way that it's worded because it says uh, um, until after the November elections. It doesn't say what year that November election is. <laughs> so this might be a little bit of a longer term uh, gig than you think, Kevin, Mr. Freeman. Um, given the level of detail and given the level of commitment, um, it was said in our workshop that they were unanimous in uh, presenting this recommendation to continue on. So I think that commit commitment is here. And given um, the complexity of their work and the amount of work that they did, I have a feeling that um, they are already thinking about how they will proceed going forward and will share with the entire community how the public can be engaged and um, some of those kind of um, vignettes or whatever might ne be needed. So I'm very, very comfortable. And again, um, you can't say thank you enough, especially in this business, um, but I want to say thank you to all of the members of the committee, especially, especially Mr. Freeman. Um, you've been around and on many, many different projects for this town, and you've done an excellent job with this committee as well, um, as well as the rest of the committee. It's been a great, great, great job. I think it's important, too, to note that there are a few people that are on the committee that could potentially have benefited financially if they weren't on this committee, um, and they put that aside because of their, and I don't want to speak for them, but just in watching them and, and seeing their work because of their love for this town and, and their drive and commitment to a new police department and fire department. And so I think that they put some of that aside and it's just very commendable to me um, for them to step up into a volunteer position instead of potentially going after, you know, a little piece of the piece of the pie. So whenever you see that, I just think it's, uh, it's, it's, not seen enough, I guess, is, is what I'm thinking. So, sorry, I don't know what I'm thinking. Anybody else? I just wanted to note that the expanded charges for education, outreach, and promotion of the project, it really takes us through for approval. I would anticipate the committee might want to talk among yourself to see if it has interest and appetite for a continued role, but that's a discussion and a decision for a different day. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, if there's no other questions or comments, uh, move the motion. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you to the committee. Um, old business, there is none at this time. Moving into new business, order number 17-065 is a first reading and referred to the planning board that proposed amendments to the Higgins Beach character-based zoning districts as presented by the planning department. Um, we use, uh, what we will do is have a presentation and then open it up for public comments before the council takes this up. So. You ready for me? We're ready for our new planning director, yes. Great, thank you. All right, now, <laughs> moment of... That's definitely not Higgins Beach. No, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. There isn't a shark in the back. Tom made me very <laughs> nervous this afternoon when I met him in the hall. He said, his shirt's going to connect? I said, yeah, it's ah. Kester in it. Anyway, <laughs> here we are. Um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me up to speak to the Higgins Beach character code um, what we're calling the 2007 audit. Um, I just want to give, I have about five or seven minutes here where I'm going to go through sort of a high level representation of the series of changes that you all have in your packet. You know, we get into a lot of detail, but going to try to give you some visuals to work your way through it. 
By way of quick background, the Higgins Beach Character Code was adopted by Council in December of 2015. So it was about two years ago this time where planning department, working with a long-range planning committee and a consultant team really began to engage the folks at Higgins Beach um, to take a look at the characteristics of the neighborhood and think about the zoning in the, in the neighborhood. And really we took a pretty dramatic approach at that point. Um, but this is really the town's first um, looking at those characteristics, the town sort of steps away from the Euclidean style of zoning, which really is about use types, separating uses, and we really started talking about form-based zoning. And this is really about um, uh, zoning based on, on, as I just said, form, and it really is designed to foster a predictable built environment and a high quality public realm. So. The audit, rather than using the sledgehammer, we're now using a scalpel. We're going back in two years later saying, all right, we have some experience with us. This is a brand new thing for our community. How have we done? Um, and so to date, what the audit has looked like is we really started with sort of staff experiences and our, our engagement with the public over that year and a half or two years. I should mention Brian Longstaff, our zoning administrator, is here with me tonight. Um, he really deals with a lot of the nuts and bolts, and I thank him for that very much. <laughs> um, and so we started with, again, as I said, sort of those experiences and brought our, our um, what we've experienced and what we've heard from the public to the Long Range Planning Committee. The Long Range Planning Committee then conducted actually a site visit in, I think it was March of this year. Um, we did a tour down in the area looking at uh, sites that have been developed under the character code, sites that were under development, and really trying to get a sense of what's working and, and maybe where we need some of those refinements. From that, we drafted some proposed amendments that were uh, issued to the public in late May, early June, and we had a, um, a public open house down at the Higgins Beach Clubhouse um, in uh, June 11th. Um, and we invited the public in. We had a great turnout, as you can see there. It was a Sunday morning, nice morning, we, and um, got a lot of feedback from that. So one of the great things that I wanted to start to touch on is sort of what's working. You know, let's start with the good, right? Um, and I think we've hit a lot of our goals. Um, we've seen a lot of projects that have been able to move forward without having to go to the Board of Appeals to get variances, which was very unusual in the past number of years before the character code came along, and those projects have been in keeping with the general character of the neighborhood. Um, generally, we're he hearing that the building forms and orientations are generally correct, and that property owners are generally able to use or to build um, uh, homes that are of the size that they desire. That's an issue we'll come back to here in a moment. So what are those things we needed to work on? Um, one of those was really around principal building shape and roof lines. What we were seeing um, and what we've been hearing about is a lot of the new homes that were being built had varied roof lines and um, undulating walls that sort of popped in and out with, without and didn't really connect to the existing character of the neighborhood. And that really was not quite in keeping with the original intent. Um, the, the intent of the ordinance is to say, you know, a primary building should have a, should have a, a, a rectangular shape. And then from that shape, you can add components. So what you're seeing here is a, sort of a typical house, and then components are added onto it, such as a porch, dormers, a rear addition. And so we've further articulated some of the language to make it clear around building masses, and we've also provided some other... Uh, definition around and, and sort of measuring tools around those components. Um, so that's one thing we heard. The other item we heard from folks is that the height and massing of the structures still felt bigger than sort of the character of the neighborhood. Um, and so, you know, as, as one walks down the street, it feels as though things are closing in given some of the heights that are allowed. So this was really one that trickier nuts to crack with the original code and with the audit. And the reason being that we have a number of people living in the neighborhood who want to keep the size of the existing cottages in those, um, in what's in the area. 
And we have a, a host of other folks who want to build larger homes and, and uh, four season homes. And so sort of marrying those two, two things takes a, a bit of work. Um, but I think we came up with some good resolutions. One of those, and I think sort of the primary approach, is to limit what's called the eave height. This is the height that you measure from the top of the foundation to the eave of the building, maximizing that at 16 feet. And so what you can see here in this picture on the right-hand side is the existing condition, and on the left-hand side is the proposed condition. Essentially what this does, and this is a great analogy we heard at the, uh, at the open house, was it, it sort of pulls the hat down tighter. What it means is you know, your roof line, your interior space, really hasn't changed much, maybe other than ceiling height, depending on how you play with it. Um, but it's pulled the houses down just a little bit to reduce that massing. Um, so here's just another picture, you know, representing mm -hmm. uh, similar. Um, so again, the amendments sort of reduce that overall massing, but still allow for three stories of living space if you move into the dormers and those sorts of things. Um, another one of the major elements that we spent some time working on were uh, fenestration requirements. This has the uh, windows and doors, sort of the openness, if you will. Um, and so some of the elements there that we uh, found out, you know, working with the working with the uh, with the code for the last couple of years is that, you know, I think around porches and dormers in particular, there were certain areas where maybe the fenestration requirements were higher than they needed to be and didn't quite work, particularly porches that are in the back of a building or a side of a building. Um, but we did also want to sort of hone in on language about the primary face of the building or the, the public face of the building facing the street and be sure that the language was clear, clear in terms of those requirements. And so that's what the packet intends to do as well. Um, another issue we felt needed some work and we heard from was around variation and flexibility of components. Um, one of the items that wasn't clear in the language that is, you could add a component to another component, for example, a porch to a side wing or rear wing or a deck. Um, so we clarified that language. And the other issue that um, we aim to address is what we call sort of the long wall issue. On the left hand side, you'll see there's a primary building with a, a rear addition. And that rear addition is right in line with that primary wall. And so as I think the Long Range Planning Committee noticed on our site visit in March, and we heard from residents, is that you know, as, as, you, as you walk along the street, it can feel as though that scale and massing is, is, is um, a bit out of character. So we're allowing some more uh, flexibility. And this is just one of the examples that are in here. But you can see on the right-hand side, that rear addition is able to kick out a, a, a couple of feet. And so it begins to break up the massing. That rear addition can step in as well, um, but it just allows for that flexibility. Um, and this is, like I said, one example of that. Uh, another example here is uh, illustrates the concept of allowing an integral balcony to be built over an integral side port, make, porch, I'm sorry, making it clear that you can build a component on top of a component. So um, sort of wrapping up here, some of the other elements that were that are in your uh, in, in the proposal are uh, considerations in dealing with existing non-conforming structures, really trying to ensure that pre-existing buildings can be modified in keeping with the intent of the code. Um, we also provided some greater flexibility for garages, clarified architectural detailing language, and we added definition sections for, to uh, define a few things. Um, that sort of is, a, as I said, a very high level overview of what's in the packet. Brian and I are here to answer any detailed questions. I did want to mention two other elements. Um, one thing that we're working on, I just touched on it with the non-conforming structures. As we've, Brian and I have worked with the language and talked with some of the residents, we think there might be a little further refinement we could do as part of this process and that may be something we'd work on to bring forward to uh, perhaps the planning board when they hold their public hearing and back to you um, if, if others are so inclined. Um, and then a longer range project that we're working on, one of the things we heard at the open house is uh, 
about the treatment of the gateway to the uh, neighborhood, not really calling that Ocean Avenue from about Spurwink, from where you turn off of Spurwink, down to around the town parking lot or so. Um, you know, that really has a different characteristic. The roadway is sort of treated different than perhaps the rest of the neighborhood. And with the original code implementation, that area was, um, it's treated the same as the, the remainder of the neighborhood. And we're, we're hearing that may, perhaps we want, might want to give some, that some additional attention. So that's on the long range planning committee's sort of radar and something we'll be working through, um, not as part of this, that would be a separate initiative, but I just wanted to make you aware that that is something we heard and are continuing to forward. So that's what I have for you this evening. Great. Thank you. Any public comment? Hi, I'm <coughs> Allison Bristol, 6 Bayview Avenue. And first, I'd like to thank the Planning Committee and Jay for the opportunity to revisit the Higgins Beach Character Code. I agree with the planning staff that now is a good time to review and revisit how the code is working and whether the town should make any changes. In 2015, I voiced my concern to the council about the adoption and broad definition of mixed use spot zoning at Higgins, which thanks to the efforts of Bill and Dan Bacon resulted in the site plan review requirement being added to Article 5. As the code is, amend the code is being amended, here are some thoughts for changes to the draft I respectfully ask the Planning Board and Council to consider. First, this, has been, this process has been a real learning experience. I'm a lay person and I for one appreciate the collaborative efforts of the town and community to retain the appearance and structural designs at Higgins Beach through character-based zoning. But the character of Higgins Beach is not solely about architectural styles and roof lines. Although character-based uh, zoning may be a better way to regulate apples-to-apple -apple uses, it doesn't help mitigate the impact of commercial development on abutting residential areas. The 2015 change for Higgins Beach included character-based zoning requirements for existing and new structures and made the newly zoned mixed use lots, the Higgins Beach Inn, the Breakers, the Clubhouse, and the Higgins Beach Market conforming, and expanded permitted commercial use on these properties. These latter two changes were not related to the shift in character-based code, but were simply zoning changes that expanded the type of commercial uses that can occur at Higgins Beach. Although the insertion of the site plan review language helped to qualify any change of use or redevelopment, the site plan review ordinance specifies construction of or addition to a single family or a two family dwelling or the alteration to a building which in total do not increase the floor area by more than 100 square feet and municipal buildings or uses are exempt from site plan review. A suggestion would be to strengthen the amended code site plan review language to stipulate that any change in the use or any expansion of the current use that may result in new or increased impacts on abutting properties would be subject to site plan review without exemption. Secondly, considering the risks of spot zoning and the potential impact to abutting properties due to this special treatment. If the intent in 2015 was to make all mixed use properties conforming, it could have been accomplished by limiting the uses to what they are today. In the case of the Higgins Beach Inn and the Breakers, the solution would be to revise the ordinance to permit the use of these properties as inns or for residential use with the same character-based requirements as the rest of Higgins Beach, but no stores or commercial activities. Further, in the case of the Higgins Beach Inn, which successfully retains its use and improve its character since changing hands, I believe it is protected by Scarborough's historic preservation pr provisions, wherein the breakers is not. So for myself and other abutters, there is a greater risk down the road, therefore making change to the site plan review language <coughs> becomes even more important. Third, uh, in 2015, the apartment building lot at 7 Pearl Street was zoned residential inconsistent with how other previously residential with commercial use properties were rezoned as mixed use. The new Article 5 language addressing non-conforming uses structure and structures provides more protections to 7 Pearl Street and other non-conforming use abutters 
than is given to mixed use of butters. And I see a red light. Do I have a few minutes to, uh, more time to, for a couple other points? Um, Am I out of time? You are out of time. If you'd like, we can actually take a copy of your comments and um, distribute them to all of the council and make them available um, in our minutes for others to read as yeah, well. Yeah, actually. Because they're very well thought out. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and if you don't mind, maybe I'll email them to Jay Absolutely. and then he can share them. Absolutely. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Anybody else that would like to speak? Not seeing any. Uh, council, questions for our planning director on the present uh, presentation? Any questions for staff? Council Rowan? Can, can, um, so I noticed there was a lot of changes to the sand dune section. I wonder if you could walk us through kind of what the intent was of that. Um, let's see. So we are in section Article 3. Yeah, Article 3. So the intent here, um, and maybe I'll ask Brian to, to help, was really to make it clear that sand dunes are regulated more stringently by the DEP, and so it really guides people and informs people that in addition to our local code, they need to talk with our state regulators. But Brian, is there more to highlight on that? Um, yes, good evening. Um, with that particular section, um, <laughs> I was informed by the DEP that we didn't really understand their regulations very well. <laughs> and I informed them that I didn't think they understood their regulations very well. <laughs> so we agreed that we would remove the language that we had in there because there were a few errors in, in some of the things that we, it was quite a, quite a process getting all of their regulations into a little table on one page mm -hmm. and trying to summarize those. So the, the learning moment there was forward those questions to DEP and have those applicants go to DEP and get those answers. And that just, that's all that did was remove any, any confusing language and just simply direct them to the DEP for the final word on, on Chapter 355. Thank you. Councilor mm -hmm. Foley, I think you had a question. Um, so I just process this, I just want to be clear, this is going to go from here back to the planning board and then it will come back to us for a second reading. Would we have a public hearing first or can we can choose to separate those out if, if need yes. be? Okay. Because I did have three calls just in the last 24 hours. I'm not sure. I'm sure the Higgins Beach Association sent out an email that this is coming about, but I want to make sure given the sensitivity that we know occurs around anything that we do. Um, and those calls, by the way, some were super supportive, like this is great, and some were concerned about a couple. So they just have, there's some additional questions we just want to make sure that we're um, proactively addressing so that we don't end up with problems later. So on a personal level, I like the hat analogy that you used and pulling it down. There's a few of the homes that, and maybe it's because I'll never probably have an opportunity to live down there, but some of them are too big. and kind of takes away for, for what I fell in love with, but I mean, I don't also don't want to inhibit uh, opportunities for property owners either to maximize what they can do. So, so are there any other questions for staff? <coughs> Council Kiesa. So uh, first of all, congratulations, Mr. Chase, on your uh, appointment as the new town planning director. I think we made a very good decision there. Um, what kind of time frame might we be looking at for those uh, adjustments beyond the Higgins Beach for that kind of buffer neighborhood that we talked about. Um, are we are we looking at you know getting through this year first, or are we is that something that maybe we'll address in the fall? Or and I'm not trying to box you in. I'm just yep. just kind of curious as to when when we might start that process and what that process might entail. Whether it's a repeat of what we did at Higgins Beach, or is it going to be kind of a smaller effort and a little more focused effort? Yep, I think the latter. I think it's smaller, more focused effort because we are talking about fewer properties, um, but certainly it would impact the whole neighborhood, so we want to be sure everyone's informed. Um, I personally would like to sort of build on the energy we have now and already started. Um, the long-range planning committee is scheduled to meet this coming Friday. It was one of the items I anticipated putting on their agenda, so um, I see it being relatively soon. All Thank things you. considered. Thank you. Any other questions before we take a motion? Not seeing any. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Is there a motion from Council? So moved. Second. Second.
questions or comments from Council Chiazzo? Yes, so as the long range planning liaison, I, I know this looks like a lot, um, but um, you know, it was really a well thought out and thorough process of evaluating that had a lot of public input built into it. Um, attending that meeting on June 11th, um, you know, there's always going to be questions and concerns, I think, and zoning is meant to be a living, breathing document. Nothing that we're doing here is set in stone. But I really think that the, the process that's being followed and the effect of these tweaks uh, are really a positive thing. And I think it shows really the, the, the town and staff's willingness to engage in that process in the long term and listen to input from other people and, and continue to work through that process. So um, I, I think uh, these changes are, 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 are well, in, well intended and certainly well received by the community. Um, I, I am looking forward to maybe some of that uh, the language on the non-conforming. I know that could be a potential issue, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that. But I would certainly encourage us to, to move this process along, not in the sense of, of expediting anything, but just to continue the process, because changes are going to keep coming through no matter what. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, to the, to the town planner's comment of kind of capitalizing on that energy that we have now, we've got a lot of good involvement, we've got a lot of good feedback, and uh, hopefully we can keep this process moving forward and maybe expand it hopefully into other beach communities in the area as well. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Donovan. Uh, I certainly support this. Uh, uh, I think the audit taught me that uh, we have a very skillful consultant and planning and code staff. Uh, it was more, a more sophisticated response than I, I mean, I think the, if we had to say, what do we need to tweak down there, it was massing uh, and height. Uh, that was very common. We heard that a lot. Uh, uh, but the ways in which they have proposed to do it without uh, really costing square footage for living space, because the, the issue here is, you know, that are the buildings proportional, proportionally correct and appropriate for what they're being built into, because these are new structures, these are teardowns oftentimes, uh, versus allowing the people to be able to have a home that's consistent with year-round living, which is really the transition that we're seeing a lot going down there. I appreciate the planning staff, including me, in uh, the early audit aspects, driving around, looking at it, um, uh, and I really think that uh, uh, they've done a great job vis-a-vis uh, -vis the massing and the dormers uh, and the uh, corridor effects that we're going to try and diminish. I have been discussing more recently with Jay and with Brian uh, the non-conforming use aspects, and this is where we're trying to get these uh, away from the ZBA, but consistent with uh, land use planning law. Uh, and in this case, uh, there, are, uh, there are structures there that don't entirely sit within the envelope as established by the setbacks. Uh, uh, and uh, whenever they try to do things, there are immediately uh, problems in going to being forced to go to the Zoning Board of Adjustment. And what we're going to try to have language looked at, which uh, we've been, uh, that uh, Jay and Brian have shared with me, uh, that we'll have reviewed by the planning board and long range planning before it comes back to us, uh, is an attempt to, again, improve the nonconforming use flexibility of still being able to do something down there without having to go back to uh, the Zoning Board of Adjustment. And the language which uh, uh, Jay sent to me yesterday, I'll read it, uh, uh, any such building may be expanded, enlarged, or increased in height provided that any such expansion or addition is within the principal building placement identified in Article 2. That's the, within the setbacks, uh, regardless of minimum or maximum setbacks. and the addition meets all other building standards of Article 4. So as long as the building meets all of the standards of the, uh, of the zone, of the uh, character zone, and is within, uh, is being done within the confines of the building envelope that's allowed, then those nonconforming uses would be permitted to be reviewed and approved by 
uh, staff as opposed to going to the Zoning Board of Adjustment. We're going to want to have that re reviewed by our legal counsel uh, and uh, air it by Long Range Planning and the Planning Board. So, But I did want to alert everybody to that as something that we're working on. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I did want to mention just to clarify on the process because um, it is a zoning uh, issue. The process is that we will have a separate public hearing from the second reading in that process, as well as the opportunity for public hearings that the planning department or the planning board uh, holds as well. So there will be plenty of opportunity for input. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing any, moving the question, all in favor? Thank you, that's unanimous. Moving on to order number 17-066. First reading and refer to the planning board the proposed amendments to chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, section 12. I'm sorry, my Roman numeral is not coming out of my head right now. Uh, sign regulations as recommended by the Ordinance Committee. Before we take public comment, would the chair of the Ordinance Committee like to provide an overview? Uh, yeah, I, thank you. Uh, we worked on this for months. Uh, it emanated from a U.S. Supreme Court case that uh, determined that uh, uh, signage, uh, and this is particularly focused on temporary signage in the right of way, uh, needed to be content neutral. And that, uh, that phrase means that you can't have different rules for the church supper and different rules for the realtors and then a different rule, set of rules for uh, political signs. And so, uh, one of the major things that uh, we undertook was to make sure that the ordinance was now content neutral. Uh, the other things that we focused on were protecting areas of vista views uh, and ecologically sensitive areas. And uh, we had a lot of feedback from uh, after the last election in November uh, where signs were uh, inundating the Scarborough Marsh area of Route 1, and people just said that that kind of thing should be controlled and restricted. So this is the, uh, uh, the second step that we undertook. The third was to promote public safety, uh, excluding signs within 50 feet of the highest accident intersections, and we relied upon Chief Moulton uh, to come, he uh, submitted data to us, uh, and, uh, and also testified. Uh, and uh, the fourth uh, was to combat pro proliferation of identical signs so that you didn't get every 20 feet the same message over and over and over again. Uh, and that uh, is now one-tenth of a mile, 520 feet, uh, is what uh, the uh, ordinance amendment would call for. Uh, we have uh, also uh, included the length of time allowed uh, for signs to be in the temporary signs in the right of way. It's largely unchanged. That, uh, those provisions had shown up in the political sign ordinance, which because it was not content neutral is being repealed as a part of this. Uh, but we're keeping the same basic uh, three consecutive weeks it was 20 days in the old political sign ordinance. Uh, we're making it three weeks, 21 days, and 12 weeks for the entire year. So uh, those are the major changes that uh, are represented by this proposed amendment to the sign ordinance. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'd like to open up to public comment. Would anybody like to get up and speak? Evening, Ben Howard, Seven Windsor Pines. I'd like to start this one with a song. <laughs> and the sign said the long-haired freaky people need not apply. <laughs> so I tucked my hair under my hat and I went in to ask him why. He said, you look like a fine upstanding young man. I think you'll do just fine. So I took off my hat and I said, imagine that. Me working for you. Sign, signs everywhere. Sign blocking up the scenery, breaking my mind. Do this, don't do that, can't you read the sign? The song's been stuck in my head uh, repeatedly uh, over the last couple <laughs> of weeks, um, and even last year. 
Um, I do agree uh, that the sign usage, particularly last year in November, was uh, kind of over the top in, in plenty of areas that it was unnecessary. Um, but unfortunately, I can't support the uh, ordinance as it is, um, particularly the section uh, J uh, regarding temporary signs, um, um, it, which was one of the big things Councilor Donovan mentioned that uh, they were in high traffic area. The documentation says temporary signs uh, shall be, uh, sorry, to pr this is to protect ecological sensitive areas, scenic views, no temporary signs shall be placed in right of ways, and also quotes public safety. After doing some research um, over uh, previous law cases in 1976, Baldwin v. Redwood City, the city claimed that an ordinance regulating the use of temporary signs not only promoted aesthetics, but also supported public safety, order, order cleanliness, and quality of the community to life. The Constitution, the Constitution sorry, I can't say that word tonight. Uh, the United, United States Court of Appeals of the Ninth Circuit found the ordinance restricted the use of political signs. Consequently, the regulations directly infringed the First Amendment rights of individuals who wanted to express political opinions in a traditional First Amendment format. Although the court recognized aesthetics as a valid uh, interest, it noted that temporary signs are predominantly used during political elections, which occur infrequently. The ban on political signs was struck down as unnecessary, burdensome, and containing an element of arbitrariness. Again, I think this um, details quite well that there is precedence in the court in 1976 that both the uh, mentioned um, in the ordinance for uh, public safety and ordinance would be found unconstitutional if it was taken to court. Um, to go on, um, there's also another example of Pez versus the city of South Eclord. Um, a city uh, ordinance prohibited all political signs on both public and private property. The ordinance was enacted to prevent a possible traffic hazard and the unsightliness resulting from the widespread use of signs. The Ohio State Supreme Court found the <laughs> ordinance unconstitutional. The court stated the aesthetic goal did not reasonably outweigh the loss of the liberty of speech. Again, tonight, um, I would support this bill if uh, these um, comments here were taken out in Section J. Uh, because as written, they are uh, a violation of my First Amendment right of uh, freedom of speech. Thank you. Any, anyone else would like to speak? Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive. Uh, I just look a quick cursory look at that section today, so I don't have any prepared remarks. Um, I wonder about the aesthetics. You know, the signs are typically, the political signs are put up for a short period of time. I don't think that should enter in the equation. Public safety, are there statistics showing that during the last election we had all kinds of, of accidents at these various locations to support this? Uh, we're eliminating every major intersection in town, most stretches of any public road in town and placing them one-tenth of a mile apart. Um, this is an affront to democracy. Anyone else would like to speak? Not seeing any, is there a motion from the council? Second. Any, Second. any comments or questions? Councilor Chiazzo? Yeah, so a, a couple things. Um, if I could, through the chair to the ordinance, committee uh, uh, chairman, uh, enforcement is always the challenge, especially during election year. And my concern is that in the past, um, my, my English teacher used to say, my, my, my junior English teacher used to say, a word to the wise is sufficient, fools need to be wrapped upside the head. Um, we don't have a very strong enforcement necessarily here, so um, with these large changes, um, I'm wondering what what the vision or expectation is for enforcement and how that's going to be carried out. Yeah, I, I've been thinking that we need a good uh, publicity and communications plan. Uh, we have a communications committee that I think is quite capable of proposing a way in which to have people be informed and that really will be the key is to make sure that candidates in particular are informed but also uh, those who are typically using 
uh, small uh, wired signs in the right of way, realtors, uh, local churches and whatnot. Uh, I think we'll make an effort uh, through the communications committee to make sure that people are informed. Councilor Sinclair. Um, I'm on the ordinance committee and uh, Councilor Donovan knows that I actually hate signs. I think they're awful. I don't use them. It's a joke. I put up two signs last year, I think, in my front yard. Um, I just, I find them, I think they're tacky. Um, I think they ruin some of the most beautiful areas that we have in this town. Um, but I do believe, and I don't have it, I'm not as, I'm obviously not as prepared as some people in the audience tonight, but I do believe that there actually is a Supreme Court case that's more recent that actually ruled in favor of this ordinance. Isn't that, is that right, Councilor Donovan? Yes. Because I was told, because of the Supreme Court, because I, I was like, yeah, let's get rid of all the signs. I don't want any of them. Get them gone. That's it. Easy. Um, and I was told that that actually is taking away people's rights um, and that there is a um, very recent Supreme Court case that says that we do have to allow um, those signs to be able to be placed and that's why um, Councillor Donovan worked on this and um, wrote it up the way he did because of the fact that we are being told by the federal government that this is the way that it has to be and we have to allow these signs to be placed. Um, so while I think there may have been an earlier Supreme Court case stating those pieces, it has now been updated and we're being told that we have to allow these signs to be placed. So um, while there are a lot of changes when you look at this, um, Councillor Donovan, kudos to him, really went to town with this and um, did a lot of work on it, and while I don't agree with it, per se, um, I'm going to support it because I think it's it's the right thing to do, and, and legally, if it came down to it, it's I believe it's what we have to do. Councilor Rowan? Um, so, I, I think there might be some confusion about what we're doing. So, we're not prohibiting all signs from the right-of-way. It's um, the signs can still be in the right-of-way under certain conditions, so we're not limiting um, speech, they can still, you can still put up signs. Uh, what we're saying is you can't put signs in environmentally sensitive areas um, and, and typically after elections we see that signs have been blown into the marsh um, and we're trying to uh, avoid that and we've gotten a lot of complaints about that. Um, and then again just kind of the congestions of signs that have, that have um, we've gotten a lot of feedback for the years from people that really don't, um, don't appreciate them and there were certainly um, some excesses in November. Um, um, and then lastly, it was there are only nine intersections in town that we that we um, are restricting the signs uh, being placed within some some number of feet. I don't I don't recall exactly. Um, Fifty feet. Thank you. Uh, and um, so I again I don't think that we're we're um, you know that it's terribly affronting to democracy uh, with these um, very um, I think even-handed and. Uh, uh, Restrictions because it's kind of it applies to everybody. Um, so it, as long as um, everyone is following the rules, and believe me, in a political campaign, as soon as your uh, opponent is uh, not following the rules, um, you, oh, you you point it out. Um, and uh, uh, lastly, uh, it was just kind of two two questions about it. I, I didn't see where we were repealing the political sign ordinance. I I felt like that was a separate bill, and maybe we didn't bring it forward in this. Uh, round, maybe we can just check on that first. It was certainly intended to. Right, I just didn't, I didn't see it in, in here. Oh, can, I, I did. We can check on that. Okay. Uh, I could have missed it. Very well, could have missed it. And then, uh, if, um, then like, lastly, I didn't understand the uh, uh, section L, the substitution clause. I don't recall exactly what that meant. That reads for every commercial sign that's allowed under this ordinance, any non commercial messaging may be legally substituted. Yeah, I don't remember that. Yeah. We can look into that. Great, thank you. Council Donovan? Uh, people should realize there's, there's no impact on uh, freedom of speech in, on private property. You can have all the signs you want on private property and uh, uh, those, we, ch we chose 
the size limitation that was the larger of the various choices we had so as to support people's right to uh, put out whatever message they wanted. Uh, we also chose a larger size than, I mean, most of these wire signs that go in the public right of way are less than two by three, uh, uh, which is six square feet. And that's what we, we chose was a, a sufficient size. Uh, we've had this reviewed by the town attorney because we knew that uh, it would be subject to the sorts of concerns. Uh, and it, we've been told that uh, well-reasoned, uh, uh, limited restrictions of this type based on public safety, uh, on aesthetics, on uh, ecological protection are all valid. Sorry, Council Foley. Um, so I love about 75% of it, <laughs> uh, particularly those, the areas protecting the marsh that uh, it has always bothered me. I never placed a single sign in the marsh, and I wouldn't be for all the reasons that were stated. Yeah. Um, so I really love that we're we're taking a look at that. Um, I'm curious, and I and I and I feel like I heard part of this conversation, but not all of it. I know the state actually last year was the first year they made the mandated certain uh, distance in between signs were duplicate signs, and I'm curious if the uh, why we didn't for simplicity's sake kind of follow that rather than expanding that. Um, so that's something that I, I'm going to still think about and process a little further. And then the one, the bigger piece, or the, probably the only piece that I somewhat object to is just simply the intersection piece in terms of, so when I think about a church or someone who's holding a garage sale or being a realtor, if I have an open house and I have my um, sign on the corner, which is most you know, where usually where you would place them, it's there for two to four hours at a time, and then it's gone. So we can use those sandwich boards and having them, you know, away from the actual corner spot. I mean, I guess one could. I, I don't know. I got to chew on that some more too. But I didn't think about that when the when the committee was having the original discussion. So um, I think overall, most of it, I am in agreement with, and I'm happy to move it forward tonight, and then maybe give some other some other pieces more thought. Council Rowan? Uh, just, just a, I wanted to, through the chair, if I could just uh, ask Councillor Foley, uh, would these be one of the intersections? I mean, these are pretty major intersections. Like, I would imagine um, you wouldn't put your sign up, for instance, at the corner of um, Route 1 and Gorham Road just because you wouldn't know where to go from there. So what you do is you kind of start at the house where you're having the open house and you do a trail back to the main route and you kind of hit so you have two or th it's like you know Hansel and Gretel leaving breadcrumbs. Gotcha. Please come to our open house, um, and you try to leave a few signs, you know, with arrows leading that way. So yeah, it would start like anything that we might have, you know, down this way. We would have a sign here, you know, in the Oak Hill intersection, um, Pine Point, same thing. So, uh, and again, I you know I, I get the intent and I respect mm. the intent because that during the political season when you have it's one thing when you have one open house sign or one church is having to be in supper, that's not overwhelming, but when you have 50 candidates all vying for that best spot, um, that's where it becomes problematic. And I realize we, you know, given what uh, I think Larissa found from, or from the attorney, we have to be very careful about um, not discriminating. So if we, whatever we go forward with has to be uniform for everybody. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Chiasm. So um, a, a couple things. I know this is just first reading. Um, I know one of the state requirements, and I, and I apologize if I missed it. I didn't necessarily pick it up in the, in the changes here, um, requiring identification, phone numbers, and dates of which the signs are going out. So if we need to do that for the state requirements, um, I'd like to see that incorporated for consistency's sake into the town as well so that there's no question about uh, what's needed uh, for contact information. Uh, number two, I'd like to see an overlay or a map or a layout of where the state enforces those laws or DOT, for lack of a better word, enforces those laws versus where we do in town because I know the Route 1 corridor, uh, there's been a lot of questions about that in the past and what areas the DOT is responsible for versus what areas the town is responsible for. 
And I, I still want to get back to the enforcement issue because communication is, is huge. Uh, however, you know, if somebody violates the situation, what happens? Do we send public works out to remove the signs and as long as they're tagged with the name and the number, they get a phone call? Uh, is it a police matter for them to pick up? Uh, there are some very, very clear, very strict guidelines about, about uh, touching political signs from citizens. So the last thing I would want to have would be, you know, uh, John Q. Public, for lack of a better word, say, your sign's in the, in the wrong area. I'm just going to pull that out for you because that is a clear violation. It's not up to them to enforce. So I'd like to see some very clear guidelines on who's going to enforce and how it's going to be enforced. Councillor Hayes. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, I guess I'm similar to, to Council Foley where, where I like some of this. I am particularly concerned about Jay, um, you know, and political signs. You know, signs go up for a reason. They are effective to get your name known. I mean, as, a, as when I ran for town council the first time, my, I wasn't well known in the town. So not allowing signs at these critical intersections really gives the advantage to the incumbents or people that have been you know, in space and had the ability to kind of get their name out. I, I really, really am concerned about what this means. I, I'd, I'd love to have Jay maybe taken back and thought about. Um, I too, I mean, for the signs are up for a period of time, they're not up for a long time. It, I, I think it does restrict the ability of new candidates to be able to get their name out and get visibility and get recognized. Those, the signs, People use the signs because the signs do work. They do get the message out. Um, so I, I think this is overly restrictive, especially in Jay. So I'm not sure I can support this. Um, that's just my two cents worth. Um, Council Donovan? Uh, the state limit was every 30 feet. Uh, and our sense was that was ridiculous to allow signs every 30 feet. That's what we saw in the Scarborough Marsh. And those were all lawfully there because they were separated by 30 feet. Uh, the uh, uh, enforcement process historically has been that people will communicate with the town clerk and the town clerk then makes an effort to contact the candidates. And that, that has been the principal method by which enforcement has taken place. I did want to mention it because uh, the town clerk actually has the state's um, um, kind of flyer up and uh, one of the other questions are about DOT. DOT gets involved if the um, sign, any sign, is within 660 feet of their road. Um, even though Route 1 is their road, it's uh, considered local. So it's uh, really 295 and 95 is where the DOT uh, kind of uh, gets involved with that. And I believe I remember hearing something about that last year. And, I, and you know, and I also wanted, I think in Scarborough last year, there was a documented case in which uh, somebody was fined for destroying a sign. Um, so there has been some enforcement, uh, maybe not as much into the detail that certain people like, but I think that a majority of people will be reasonable and will follow the rules. And believe me, um, first of all, having run as many times as I have, signs do not make people vote for you. Otherwise, Hillary Clinton would be president. Um, and the fact is, I had seven signs when I ran three years ago. So. Um, I don't see this as being unreasonable. The one piece um, that I heard last year, the three issues that I heard complaints about was the height of signs, the size of the signs, and then the scenic issue. So I'm glad um, they were taken care of. I did not see anything in there about the heights. Um, so maybe if you could direct me to kind of look at that, uh, if it's in there. Yeah, yeah. And then last is that um, it's about what is considered temporary. So per the ordinance, temporary is a matter of time rather than um, including some definition around the structure itself because there is a difference between, you know, the paper sign that you, or even a wooden sign that you put into a metal stake that can be easily removed versus one that you might have two by fours planted <laughs> solidly into the ground that can't be carried off. Um, and whether or not that's actually, is that really temporary or is that um, different? And it should, it, should it be different? So, um, you know, a couple of questions, but I think generally, I think it's great work. It addresses most of those issues, and I can, I'm, I'm happy to move it forward. Because again, it's a zoning issue. There will be a public hearing, and will be a separate second reading. How's it yeah, sorry, this, that just brought up kind of one thing. I know in the past, uh, handmade signs have kind of been an exception to the printed signs. Um, I'm not sure how that's addressed in this 
uh, in, in this ordinance, if they're still considered temporary or if they're kind of lumped under the same thing in the past, if it's a, you know, a hand-painted sign or a stenciled sign, those tend to be, uh, they have a, a wider, um, uh, wider requirement, if you will. They're not as restrictive or as restricted as some of the posted signs. That, that's my understanding, and the town clerk can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that, that that's, that's been an issue with the political sign. So um, I'm not sure if that's addressed here or not, but, but if it's not, it should be so that it's clear to, to people moving forward what's included and what's not included. Council Sinclair? I believe in this we lumped them all together. We didn't actually, and correct me if I'm wrong, Councillor Donovan, but we did not um, pull those out and specify those in this, um, but I agree that it that it should be. At least just for clarity, so that people understand that they are included in this. Any co uh, comments or questions from Council? Not seeing any moving in the motion forward, all in favor? That is, and all opposed? One, that's six to one. Order number 17-067 is a first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 601, Town of Scarborough's Traffic Ordinance, Section 25, Parking Restrictions, as recommended by the Ordinance Committee. If the Chairman of the Ordinance Committee can give us an overview before public comment. And these are uh, some uh, parking uh, restriction amendments on East Grand Avenue that were brought to our attention by the Police Department. Uh, it was intended as an update, uh, clarifying uh, 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 a few details on where the location of the start and stop points are for uh, allowed parking. Uh, it's, this is relatively ministerial in nature. We are also in that process. Uh, businesses along East Grand Avenue are allowed one business sign uh, per, uh, per business. Some of those businesses were no longer in uh, existence and so uh, there were some changes there but that was able to be handled administratively by the police department so uh, that was corrected uh, and uh, it was good work by the police department to identify this. They worked with the uh, businesses along East Grand Avenue including the new barbecue restaurant uh, at the corner at uh, uh, Conroy's Garage good. up and running. Thank you. Any public comment on the order? Anybody would like to get up and speak? Again, Mo Erickson, 288 Pine Point Road. Um, parking in Pine Point has always been a source of contention for me, as you well know. I've complained about it. I think I'm, I should start using ver reverse psychology with you guys because I I begged you and begged and begged for about seven years to not allow parking on the Pine Point Road, and then all of a sudden now there's 28 paved spots on the Pine Point Road for parking. There's still parking um, past those spots all the way up on the Pine Point Road. They're parking on um, alongside of the Pine Point Road by by the Clambake along that green curb and all the way up. Um, it's a mess. It's just a mess. Those parking spaces close to the garage are taken by the garage employees um, early in the morning before the restaurant opens. I've seen them park there and then walk to their job, which is fine, but they're not for the general public when the employees park there early in the morning, I can tell you that. Um, I wish, I really wish you guys would maybe get the little community van and all of you hop in it and go down to Bailey's Lobster Pound on Friday and Saturday night at 5.30 till 7.30 and watch the fiasco that happens down there with that valet parking because what they do is they have their valet guys stop cars in the middle of the road and they do the valet parking there. They have those valet guys, I saw them just the other day, standing in the middle of the road helping people stop their cars and figure out what am I doing? You know, normally with valet parking, you go to a hotel or a restaurant and there's a spot where you pull over away from on you know traffic that's actually moving and the valet guys take your car and off you go but that's not how that works here I promise you it's a mess I really I can't believe you've let it go on all this time I can't believe that um, more of the 
people who have to trailer their boats back and forth and the neighbors in the area, they are putting up with a, a mess. Um, and I just think it's really unfair that you allow this one business to just run the neighborhood amok, and I'm really tired of it. So um, I, I know this isn't particularly about all the little side streets. Generally, there's no parking on those roads anyway, and I think people are, are used to not parking there, but um, now there's parking in front of the garage also, and that kind of, I, I've seen cars park where they're not supposed to park there. So. I don't know. I just, I wish you guys would <laughs> try to get a better handle on it. I guess that's what this is all about. So, but I really implore you to go down to Bailey's Lobster Pound and see the mess that goes on there on a Friday or Saturday night. Thank you. Anybody else would like to speak? Not seeing any motion from the council. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any comments or questions? Councilor Hayes. Yeah, just a, just a quick question. These. So uh, these are characterized as sort of minor changes. Do these actually remove any parking spots? No. It doesn't. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Oh, Councilor? Um, I just wanted to uh, comment uh, to our speaker. I, I have actually spent the last two weekends, uh, I've gone down and done some loops, um, and I hear the concern, and I have gotten some calls. I, you know, I don't know that it's anything we can uh, address quickly. But I do think that things are changing down there very rapidly, uh, particularly with my bigger concern was um, uh, music and the volume uh, coming from one of the establishments down there. So um, anyway, uh, so I, I hear you and I am keeping an eye and I, ha and, and I uh, will try to pass that information along and we'll see what happens. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing any, moving the motion. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. And, uh, order number 17-068 is the first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 604A, Town of Scarborough's Horse Beach Permit Ordinance, Section 604A-6, Regulation on Horses on the Beach, as presented by the Ordinance Committee. And I think this is the last report from the Ordinance Committee Chairman, so uh, would you like to give us an overview, Mr. Chairman, before, you, uh, before we have public comment? Certainly. Uh, uh, this is a requirement for what is euphemistically called bun bags, catches the uh, cow dung manure uh, uh, on the beach. Uh, we have a coordinated permit program of Old Orchard Beach. Uh, uh, for years we had this condition in our uh, ordinance, but when we went to a coordinated program with Old Orchard Beach. It was Old Orchard Beach did not have it, and so uh, we decided not to continue it. Uh, this is applicable to off-season use. This is October 1 to sometime in the spring. Uh, so it's uh, 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 not in the uh, in-season. Uh, the number of permits, just to provide a little more background, uh, has gone down actually considerably as uh, Scarborough Downs has had uh, less and less uh, uh, racing, uh, but it still exists. Uh, the public interest here is obvious to have the beach kept clean. Uh, we have received reports and testimony from uh, people from the Pine Point community that uh, it is not the case, and uh, that includes the difficulty in just doing it. Uh, horses are large, uh, oftentimes much larger than the people riding them, and getting on and off a large horse is no easy trick. Uh, and so uh, people tend to think, well, it'll be washed away by the next tide. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a pretty objectionable to people who are walk walking the beach uh, during that time. So uh, it was a unanimous consent of the Ordinance Committee to uh, uh, propose that we reinsert this bun bag requirement uh, for uh, horses. Thank you. Uh, with that, is there any public comment? Not seeing any yet. Is there a motion from the Council? So moved. This Second. Any comments or questions? Council Rowan? I, I'd just like to say that it, um, it was really a, a matter of compliance. The current, current ordinance requires that uh, horse owners pick up the uh, certification, 
when it happens, uh, and it's not happening. So um, this is kind of the stuff to address it, which is that they have to have uh, bun bags on there. Um, and then I believe there was also a coordinated effort to reach out to Old Orchard, um, and they were also going to going to amend their their ordinance as well. Was kind of the agreement. Great, Council Foley. Yeah, I would just. I mean, I, I've heard kind of you know arguments on both sides and folks who think it's unreasonable, but I, I think it's as Will said, it's an uh, issue of compliance. You you have this ability to do this, and um, you lost. You, you know, the next step would be no no horses on the beach, and I would hate to see that because I love seeing the horses down there. But I also don't like to go down there and have my dog chase the horse poop. So <laughs> that happens too. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm going to support this. Hmm. Any other comments? <coughs> Not seeing any. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Um, oh, uh, order number, uh, where is it? Order number 17-069, which is the item that was adjusted and added, is an act on the request from the police department to accept the Community Development Block Grant, or CDBG, in the amount of $33,000 for Operation HOPE, with the Town Council's supported submission of the grant application at February 15, 2017 meeting, as uh, presented to us by the police department. And um, Tom, would you like to give an overview yeah, before public comment? Certainly. Uh, back in February, as you mentioned, um, the police department approached this council uh, with an idea to apply for some CDBG grant funding. Again, uh, really viewed as a band-aid to something bigger, better, probably not done by us in the future. Uh, but resources are being stretched thin at the police department. And so uh, this council wholeheartedly supported that uh, application and we're pleased to report back to you and the public that we've been successful. And so it's only fitting we bring this good news back to you and look for your um, authorization for us to accept these funds. This is $33,000 uh, in exchange for $6,600 in in-kind um, match, if you will. Uh, Chief Moulton's here as our uh, both captains as well, if you have questions about the particulars of the grant application. Any questions from council for staff? Not seeing any. Yet. Is any oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Council <laughs> Rowan? Um, I, I was just curious. So we're, we're meeting that contribution now with in kind. I mean, we'll get credit for the time spent. Yes. I mean, all of that's uh, already kind of part of the program. Uh, but for purposes of the grant application, we actually calculated it, and they're crediting us um, the effort already put forward. Uh, by way of in-kind services. Any other questions for staff? <coughs> for anybody from the public that would like to speak? Not seeing any, is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Okay. Any comments? Council St. Clair. I think this is wonderful. Great job, Chief, and everybody that participated in this. Um, you know, obviously we all know it's a program that other communities are now um, adopting and, and um, creating programs that are similar to the program that the chief and his crew have um, come up with and I just think it's a wonderful thing. I had spoke with someone two or three weeks ago that actually went through the program and he said from the minute he walked into the PD to the minute he got done and out of rehab has probably been the best he's I don't know, 40, 40, in his late 40s, said it's probably the best he's ever felt in his entire life. And he feels like he got his life back. Makes me, like, emotional. Because <laughs> um, he's a good man, and uh, I just, you know, went down a bad road. And because of a program that somebody dreamed up, this man is now there for his family, and I just can't imagine a better gift. So um, congratulations. I wish it was more. I know you need more. Um, and I hope there will be more coming, but um, this is a great start, so great job. Yes, yeah, so I, I very much appreciate the funds. I know it's uh, well-deserved and well-needed, but I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity, like I do every time, to say this is not the solution. It's part of the solution, but it's not the solution. To continue along this process and hope that things get better really aren't realistic. We need to have a concerted effort on the state level for treatment, uh, prevention and, uh, and 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 education and um, while this is very noble and I very much respect the efforts of our community and our police department for putting this forward it's a band-aid and there needs to be a bigger discussion and a bigger solution so I certainly support it I wish it were more I wish it wasn't necessary 
um, but it is, and uh, I think we're, we're addressing it as best we can with the resources that we have. Anyone else? Not seeing any, move the motion, all in favor? And it's unanimous, thank you. <coughs> thank you. There are no non-action items standing in special committee reports and liaison reports. I'll start with um, Councilor Chiazzo. Uh, so long range planning is Friday, so we haven't met yet. Um, transportation didn't necessarily meet, but we did uh, participate in the Pine Point master plan meeting um, yesterday at the Pine Point Fire Station. Um, and I'll, I'll just read a, a little excerpt from, from that. Uh, last night, the Public Works and Planning Departments held a community discussion at the Pine Point Fire Station on King Street. The discussion was aimed at soliciting public input related to potential improvements in the Pine Point neighborhood, specifically along East Grand Avenue and the intersection of East Grand Avenue and Pine Point Road. The meeting was well attended by 60 residents from the area, and there was a lively discussion, to say the least, those are my words, um, as well as an interactive approach that the design team used to gather feedback and opinions on complete streets elements that residents would like to see in future projects. While more detailed summary of the uh, will be provided for the Transportation Committee to review uh, at upcoming meetings, the highlights were that the majority of the residents in attendance saw the value in having separate space for bicycles on the road cross sections. They saw efficiencies with having sidewalks on one side of the road and parking on the same side of the road. Uh, for intersection improvements at Pine Point Road and East Grand Avenue, the majority of the residents liked the idea of reconstructing that into a four-way stop over a more costly roundabout, since the level of service for each of those designs would be uh, similar in nature. Uh, there was also general discussion on the peninsula side of Pine Point, and a questionnaire was provided for residents to give more general feedback on the things that are currently working and deficiencies they see and opportunities for amenities in the area. Uh, all the presentation materials will be posted on the town website by the end of the week, and more opportunities for public feedback will be provided prior to finalizing any design plans. Uh, if the councilors of public have any questions or comments, they can be directed to town engineer Angela Blanchett or certainly through any councilor. Excellent. Councilor Hayes. Nothing this evening. Thank you. Councilor Sinclair. Um, uh, just a quick couple of quick things. Um, communications has a roundtable set up for Wednesday, July 26th at 6 p.m. Uh, in council chambers. It's a focused type group. Normally in the past we've kept them open to whatever the community wants to talk about. Um, this is going to be solely focused on the budget and moving forward. Um, clearly we're hoping that we're going to be talking about um, you know, next year and what residents have for feedback um, because it is the day after the um, election. Um, and we're obviously all hoping that that passes, but in the event that it doesn't, um, I'm sure that we'll have some residents that want to discuss that, but our goal in this meeting is to be discussing ways that we can move forward as a community um, as one and um, try to find ways to all kind of come together. So that is um, scheduled for Wednesday, July 26 at 6 p.m. That's it for me. Thank you. Councilor Foley. Uh, so the Conservation Commission uh, met last week and they started digging into um, the old comprehensive plan uh, and I thought they asked some really good questions and because they're trying to uh, prepare and have insight for, for Planapalooza, I can barely say that, in September. Uh, they want to kind of really think about, they feel like they've accomplished a lot but they don't have necessarily have those hard metrics. So like what of this list have we accomplished, what is still relevant, uh, and where do we need to go, and what projects might be missing. So um, that was some good work. Uh, rules and policies meeting in August, and we are doing a full review. So I know throughout the last six months there have been a few items people have brought up. I've tried to capture them. In the event that I haven't, please feel free to send me an email. Um, Eastern Trail Alliance is officially under $500,000 left in their uh, Close the Gap uh, campaign. So they're pretty excited about that. It was a big threshold to cross. Mm -hmm. And they've been looming right around it for a while now, so it's official. Um, and then, and that's it for now. Taking the news, that's great. Councilor Rowan? Uh, affordable housing met on the 28th of June. Unfortunately, that was our, um, uh, one, our public hearing for, public the, for the budget. Uh, and uh, I was unable to attend, and I don't yet have an update, so I'm going to try that next time. Other than that, I have nothing. Councilor Donovan. Uh, the Metro Regional Coalition, uh, which Tom uh, 
got me involved in, got me chair this year, uh, has been very active. This is the seven communities that include Portland and surround Portland. Uh, we did a tour a couple of weeks ago of an Avesta housing project in Portland. It was a multi, 30 unit, uh, multi-family uh, uh, apartment building. And it was uh, uh, housed the 30 most homeless people in the greater Portland area. And they were chosen uh, by professionals in the uh, Preble Street program uh, out of 125 people who were terribly needy. I mean, to hear the stories, it was heart-wrenching to, to hear the stories. But the building is uh, fantastic. It's set in a light industrial setting. Uh, obviously, you, with, with that kind of thing, you have a huge NIMBY problem. But Portland is advancing this issue. It's called Housing First, uh, where they get housing for homeless people, get them in, and the results in terms of reduced police contacts with these people. They told the story of one person who had 300 police contacts last year. This year, uh, uh, the la uh, since he's moved in, six contacts with the police, five of which were seizures <laughs> that had to be called in because of his condition. Uh, but this is, uh, this is something that the Metro Regional Coalition is grappling with because how the metropolitan uh, communities help in this, Portland doesn't own this at all. These people come from all over, but they end up in Portland uh, uh, for a whole lots of reasons, which I think we all know. Uh, so it's, it's not going to be an easy problem, but it's uh, squarely on our agenda uh, uh, at the present time, so I'll be reporting on that as we go. Uh, pest management uh, met yesterday uh, it's Green was introduced. Joe Foray, uh, uh, the uh, new contract person, they're working on a comprehensive schedule. Uh, uh, they're borrowing some equipment from Freeport to start to do a reseed on the idea that if you inundate it with uh, uh, a new seed, you can force out those weeds. So that was a, a very good. Terry Eddy, very active member of that committee, introduced some new educational materials, and I'm going to uh, review them, and if I find something there that is uh, helpful, I'll share it with you. The Vision Committee met this week. This is the leadership group made up of people from SEDCO and the Scarborough uh, Chamber of Commerce. Their focus uh, uh, is uh, an outreach to business, the business community of Scarborough for comprehensive plan input. And that's what they're uh, working on, and uh, Karen is working on. Uh, uh, like Chris, I attended the East Grand Avenue Complete Streets uh, a meeting because I personally think that the Complete Streets program is going to be and should be one of the vital programs that we advance with the comprehensive plan. Because allowing people to get to all of these wonderful scenic uh, and vacation spots, uh, beaches, marshes, and whatnot, uh, where there's always inadequate parking, and to be able to promote access, uh, the Complete Streets program is going to uh, be an important part of it. Thank you. Um, I have nothing to report tonight. Um, I'm going to turn it to the town manager's report. Great. Thank you. Um, to start this evening, I might break from a little bit of tradition, but while I have the floor, so to speak, I, I thought I'd use the opportunity to present and discuss and be available for input from the council, if you wish, uh, my proposal and recommendation for implementation of the paid parking at Higgins Beach. These are the 13 metered spaces. And I intentionally uh, have put it on the agenda uh, like this because um, knowing history what it is, this will garner some interest, and I expect um, we'll get some input. So I wanted to publicly have some disclosure of my recommendation, and then at a subsequent future meeting of council, the matter would be on for your formal consideration. But that will allow certainly you time to digest the proposal, uh, allow the public to do the same and provide input. So hopefully when it comes back on your agenda, uh, we're in a position to, to move forward. So essentially, just quickly by way of background, in 2011, uh, was the first time that on-street spaces were instituted on Bayview Avenue. Uh, there's 13 spaces. There's a 
about a 50 foot uh, drop off area that's used to, as the name suggests, drop off and pick up customers. Um, and I believe two handicap spaces uh, are involved as well. Uh, fast forward, we had three or four years experience and generally it was positive. There were you know, some challenges with instituting something new. Uh, but in 2015, the council heard a number of concerns, if not complaints, about behavior issues and some parkers staying longer than others. Uh, at that time, there was some discussion and it was decided to actually install a meter to assist uh, in implementing and enforcing the one-hour regulation. Uh, and really that experience, in my opinion, has been generally positive. Uh, Chief Moulton may have some differing opinion in that regard. It's he and his staff that are on the front line, so to speak. Uh, but generally, um, from my perspective, that program's worked fairly well. And I guess the final piece to the background is most recently as part of the fiscal year 18 budget, there was instituted for the first time a fee for that uh, one hour parking. And I've been tasked with um, considering the options and providing a recommendation or proposal as to how and when to uh, implement that, um, uh, that additional piece. Uh, generally, uh, not just generally, uh, specifically I should say, I, ca I employed the KISS principle. Um, I want to keep it as simple as possible and keep it as consistent to the existing program. Uh, I think folks have come to appreciate and comply generally with the way it currently works. And so uh, just to uh, mention how it works currently, there is a one, one metered station that services all of the metered spaces. Um, it's not so far that it's not inconvenient, it seems to work quite well in that regard. Uh, essentially, um, a user would approach the meter, they'd be asked to imp uh, input their license number, and um, at this point there historically has not been any charge, so a ticket is issued, time stamped, and uh, the parker is directed to put that sticker, or excuse me, that ticket visibly displayed on their dashboard on the driver's side and then our enforcement officers, reserve officers, are able to uh, make their way up and uh, back and forth along those spaces and observe um, and enforce compliance. So all of that would certainly stay the same. Uh, when we purchased the meter, we had some sense that this might be an area that wanted, the council wanted to explore, and so the meter comes equipped with the capability of uh, receiving payment, and there's a a fairly simple uh, programming component that uh, we've already consulted with them. Um, so the only difference to the program is uh, payment of some sort uh, or otherwise satisfying that requirement is now required before that same ticket is issued. Um, a couple of things, and uh, I've received a lot of input and I expect I'll receive more, but I, I do recommend that we accept coins and credit card only. Um, Apparently from our vendor, the uh, dollar bills or uh, paper currency is fraught with service issues and challenges. Uh, given the amount that we're charging, I suspect coins might be a very popular option in that regard. So my, again, my recommendation would be accepting coins and credit card only. Uh, I also recommend that we don't ex uh, try to, uh, to accept increments of one hour and increments of payment, if you will. I think it's modest enough at this point that we should, it should be one hour um, and not accept any increments. And further to ex uh, require payment for all allowable times, um, current allowable times to park there as opposed to uh, granting some forgiveness at certain times of the day, morning or night or what have you. Uh, and I offer those recommendations uh, with the further suggestion that current season pass holders and future season pass holders, both resident and non-resident alike, uh, not be required to pay, that that's part of what they get with their annual fee. And the way that would work, each, uh, each current pass that's issued, these are the ones that are affixed to the window, windshield of each vehicle, and incidentally, uh, each vehicle must have its own. We don't issue one to a family, so to speak. Each vehicle has its own. So there are discrete four-digit numbers that go with each of those. And again, the meter would be programmed to require prompt the input of that number and um, a ticket would be issued time stamped um, almost very similar to what it is currently but no actual payment would be required. The one nuance is for senior passes, our current and historical practice is not issuing a window sticker, it's actual kind of a business card that they carry on their person. 
Um, and so in the near term, I would recommend the same process be followed. There is a four-digit number on that card. Uh, but on the dashboard, not only the ticket, but the card be displayed if possible. Um, and I think in the future, we have great opportunity for streamlining this and simplifying it at the time of issuance. But given where we are in the season and the challenges of reaching out to the current um, active pass holders, um, I propose this as kind of an interim step. Uh, it appears as though one or more town committees may be considering fees and kind of all these sorts of things over the next, over the winter perhaps. And so some of this may well come back up again in conversation. Um, I guess finally, I would suggest that we, um, if the council is willing, this matter come back to you on your August meeting for formal consideration. Again, at that point, hopefully you've had time to think about it um, and received input from the public perhaps. And then we look for an implementation uh, for September 1. Now, obviously, much of the season is currently gone, but um, I think it may be helpful for us to have some experience this fall uh, just to work the bugs out, if you will. And um, there are certainly are options for a delayed implementation, but I, I think it might be good for us to have some experience as things slow down and wind down for the season. And we'll be in a better position come next spring when we're back up and running uh, full strength. <coughs> Um, I did provide the council a memorandum that uh, reviews those details of my recommendations. It's, it was on the agenda and intended to be uh, consumed by the public, so I, it's out there. Uh, perhaps I could work with the um, chair of the communications committee to get this further out there, really for, to the point of getting more input. If that's uh, a, a value, I, I think it probably is. Um, so with that, uh, I can certainly take respond to any questions or receive input now if you wish. Um, beyond that, I do have another other, number of other things to report Absolutely. on. So I'll proceed on and perhaps at the at the end we'll we'll stop back at it. I do have one question. Sorry. Please. Credit card processing fees, how does that work with the meters? Uh, there, there, there's a third party that's used. Um, I can report, I don't know what those costs are, but there's typically a percentage of each transaction um, that uh, that's assessed to the cardholder. And that's, that's the typical way we do it for third party processing. Okay. I wanted to mention, um, it's been out in the newsletter and through I think social media as well, but Scarborough has implemented Scarborough Fix It. This is a, a, an application that's available for smartphones. Uh, the app can be downloaded at the Apple App Store or at Google Play for Android users. But it's a, it's a great opportunity for residents to communicate directly to us if they see anything that needs attention in their view, whether it's roadkill or a pothole or um, certainly not for emergency situations, but anything that's worth reporting that they would otherwise pick up a phone and try to find which department they should be speaking with on the back end, we've set up protocols for, given the nature of a, current, uh, a particular complaint, it's routed automatically to the appropriate department for review, response, um, and the app also allows others to kind of jump in and view what's happening around, and uh, you can share photos if, if you wish to. So um, we're having good experience so far. We hope more people start using it, frankly. Uh, but we get probably 10 or 12 a day at this point, and we expect it'll pick up as we go forward. Uh, again, um, so search on your app store for Scarborough Fix It, and it should come right up. Um, Please report that we uh, ha are going through a RFP process for an upgrade to this building. This is for audio, visual, and broadcast capabilities. There are monies in the budget. Um, I don't believe we're going to be able to afford to do everything we want to do, uh, but it's going to come back to us, I think, in a series of phases. But I think we'll be very pleased. We have two extremely capable vendors who have um, expressed interest, and we're currently working through that as we speak. Uh, the challenge will be for us to find a handful of days that they can have hmm. access to the space without uh, disrupting public meetings, but we'll do our best uh, to carve out some time in the fall, I'm sure. I'm also pleased to uh, mention that Scarborough has been selected to participate, I believe, one of 40 communities nationwide in a pilot project for something that they've developed as a financial stability index. And this is um, a number of these elements are, have been conversation points of the Finance Committee over the last couple of years. 
Um, this is being sponsored and coordinated through the Government Finance Officers Association, which is really the foremost uh, organization. Mm -hmm. And essentially, we've been given a grant uh, to be one of the 40 participants. And I believe there will be communities of all shapes and sizes and needs, and they're trying to come up with a, an index that will serve all types. And so we're pleased to kind of be in the middle of that process. Um, Larissa Crockett, the Assistant Township Manager, or Town Manager, has really led up that project so far, but we'll certainly be pulling in um, Ruth Porter from Finance and other departments, and I would like to involve the Finance Committee as we go forward. Uh, on the personnel front, um, as was mentioned, Jay Chase uh, is our new Planning Director. Uh, kind of an anticlimactic um, announcement. <laughs> uh, I was particularly uh, pleased to see that he, in his first slide, used Gallagher the comedian. Um, so there's a sense of humor. That's Yeah, I was very pleased to see that. Um, HR director is the other senior staff position that's currently open. We have moved very swiftly through that process, um, had 25 applicants or so, very, very good quality many with direct experience doing this job in another community. Um, so I'm very encouraged that we'll have someone sooner than later and someone that can hit the ground running. Uh, second interviews are the first week of August. Um, and it's worth noting the first round interviews is something I've never done before. I, I sat in as more of an observer, uh, but the interview panel was made up entirely of staff and not senior staff. It was folks that uh, work in departments or have um, uh, their position requires a fair amount of interaction with HR, and we had them all submit questions, and they asked their questions. We, we vetted them slightly and helped kind of massage them, but the substance w was theirs, and I was very, very pleased to, um, they asked questions that I would never even have thought of, and um, it was very insightful. So it's something that um, I was pl very pleased we did. We'll transition back to the more traditional format in second round. I've got a number of senior staff that are assisting me on the interview panel and I really like to surround myself with as many different perspectives as possible. Um, I should mention uh, there was a workshop, obviously, at 6 o'clock this <coughs> evening. The expectation is to have a matter before you at your next meeting in August to formally consider putting this matter on the ballot. Uh, Tody can speak to the exact time frames, but uh, in order to get a matter on the ballot, um, a decision needs to be made far in advance of the, uh, of the election. Um, so I, we'll put it on the 16th, August 16th meeting. I think if push comes to shove, we might be able to push that to the first September meeting. Um, but um, I would suggest, and I think the council chair concurs, we at least put it on your agenda and have that conversation <coughs> at your next meeting. And if I could ask in advance, if we could have that as the first item on the agenda, that way the public, yes, sir. that might, yeah, they won't have to wait through half of the meeting to be able to take it up at the end, or you know. Sure. Yep. Good. And last thing is uh, Avenue 2. Um, I've reached out to the parties. I've, I've not been directly involved. They had some very good dialogue. Uh, they had a site walk and they're waiting for some, uh, for the consultants to do some additional work on the landscape plan and the like. And I believe that work will be done this week. And so it's possible that something may be scheduled back before you at your next meeting. So I'll stay tuned and I'll keep you informed. But um, that, that's what I know as uh, about that matter at this point. I guess the final point I'll, I'll just make is um, I appreciate your support. I, I provided a budget message that was sent out through social media and through our e-newsletter. Um, there are words that I, I thought were I, I wanted to make for some time, and I appreciate your support allowing me to make them, frankly. And so far they seem fairly well received. Uh, I've received a number of um, comments back, and I just want to make sure that everyone gets out and does their part next Tuesday on the 25th. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, council member comments. Council Donovan? Uh, thank you. Uh, to Tom's point about uh, parking, uh, uh, metered parking, it was perceived at the, by the people I've come into contact with at Higgins Beach last year that uh, the metered parking enforcement was tremendously successful. It was a big advancement in terms of addressing the problems that had been of a concern. So uh, uh, they would, I think, applaud the council for having initiated uh, and strengthened the enforcement down there. Uh, as far as uh, uh, the school vote and the signage out there, 
I don't think anyone should misunderstand. There's been no criticism of the voters. Uh, the vote was the vote, and you have to honor the vote. That's, that's been my view. It doesn't mean that you give a pass to people who misrepresent the circumstances out there. You call a spade a spade. Uh, a misrepresentation is a misrepresentation. We now have new signs out there. One of the things that we do whenever we put out a tax impact analysis is we have, and this was Councilor Rowan's effort at putting it into policy so that we, we won't know until August exactly what the revenue stream is from new assessed value in the town. So we take the 10-year average, uh, we have a high, a medium, and a low. Uh, that is in every tax uh, impact uh, uh, analysis that we put out. It's always there. It is not in the smart taxes 6.8 uh, signage. They didn't include that. Again, a fundamental error, a fundamental uh, inconsistency with the way in which representations are made to the community about uh, tax impact. So there again, here we have the first one where they had just 7.4 percent increase. Everyone who, who looked at it who hadn't been close to this said, oh, what a crazy tax increase that is. Uh, now it's school tax increase, and they leave out a fundamental revenue stream that's always included. So uh, uh, if you look at the real facts, uh, uh, and these are facts I would say I would expect smart taxes to argue from, because we heard some speakers tonight say 3% is too much, but that's an honest statement. Well, make the argument from the facts that are real. We're going to have a tax impact of less than 3%. We have a school year over year spending increase of under 3%. About 2.88% is the school's actual increase in funding. Uh, we've got one of the lowest uh, uh, tax rates in the, in the region amongst all of the communities that surround Greater Portland. We have one of the lowest uh, 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 tax rates, $15 and change. We have data from the state of Maine that says Scarborough is right in the middle from a per student cost point of view. We're not spending money exorbitantly on our school system. We're very average. Uh, and so look at the job they're doing, uh, uh, rated as highly as they are. Those are the facts that we should be arguing but you never hear them. All we have is misrepresentations, and I think that's very unfair to the public. It's the public who loses from, the, from these circumstances. The uh, uh, other thing that I did want to talk about, which I think is a lot more enjoyable to talk about, uh, is uh, uh, the Eastern Road uh, test uh, of the Complete Streets program was a success. Uh, talking with Angela uh, uh, and Mike Shaw the other day, uh, I ran into them uh, getting bagels. Uh, they uh, said very good feedback uh, from the pedestrian and from the bicyclist side. No real pushback from the driver's side. So they take that as a real plus as far as the report. They're going to do Eastern Road now that it's been repaved in that manner. Uh, uh, I've heard a number of good reports back on the project uh, from Pine Point Road uh, uh, down from the event center uh, down to the corner. Uh, and I went down the other day just so I could see it, went to the meeting at the fire station, uh, and it does look nice. Uh, I would have liked uh, to have done more there in terms of aesthetics and landscaping, but uh, Complete Streets I think is going to be a big deal uh, for all of us to promote all the things we really love about Scarborough. Thank you. Thank you. Council Rowan? So as you can tell by my sticker, I voted today. Um, and I wanted to put out the reminder that uh, early voting ends tomorrow um, for non-special uh, circumstances. So uh, it's tomorrow or next Tuesday or um, unless you have a special circumstance. Um, so took the whole family, voted, I took the day off, and then we went to uh, Fo uh, Hong 
down the street. Uh, tremendous restaurant. I was remiss in not having gotten there before. I'm definitely going back. Um, um, and then my, my last point, and I, I, again, I, I don't want to come across as, as shaming or, or uh, being a bully, uh, but I do take exception to the, the signs that are out that say that there's a school tax increase of 6.8%. And I wrote a fairly lengthy um, post on Facebook um, kind of to explain that point of view. Um, but to, um, to Bill's point, it doesn't take into account the fact that we're projecting a, an increase in valuation uh, in the town and uh, the, we're, um, uh, the 10 year average would have a $49 million um, increase uh, in valuation, which would translate to um, 812,000 new dollars in dollars in new tax revenue. Um, we have municipal state revenue sharing is up $50,000. Uh, business e equipment tax exemption is up $40,000. Homestead exemption reimbursements are up $125,000, and their non-education revenues um, in our budget are up $650,000. None of those dollars have a um, designation associating with them to say that we can't spend them um, for um, to pay our largest bill in town, which is our schools. Um, if you put applied all of that to our education spending, um, and you said our net education spending, our net education budget now includes those uh, dollars would be down under 1.2%. Uh, so um, I think that there's a, um, some valid points that we can argue, but I think that, um, that calling the school tax increase, uh, which, that, which isn't a real thing, 6.8% uh, is not a real um, substantive argument, and that the actual tax increase, uh, which is what we worked really hard to uh, get down uh, to under 3%, is what it is. And so hopefully, you know, we'll have uh, support for this budget and we can move on. Thank you. Okay, I guess we're going there. Um, so I have a, a little different view uh, than Councilor Donovan and, and Councilor Rowan in that I, I don't believe either side is intentionally uh, trying to mislead. I do believe people feel very passionately about their viewpoint and and I know that because I come from an Irish, Scotch, French, Polish family that gets very passionate about various issues um, and uh, but what I will say because um, I do think some of the comments at some times were not appropriate um, both from behind the council table and other tables and from the public I would like to see our community do a lot better on both sides. In fact, I'd like to get rid of the sides and see us find a way to come together and work together on the concerns because I do believe 3% every year for some people um, is a hardship. For others, you know, I have no empathy uh, uh, necessarily because the abundance is clear uh, in looking at their homes and the cars they drive and things like that. And I know that's somewhat judgmental, but I, but I feel that. So I do think we can do better. Um, I think it's anybody's guess what's going to happen. I do hope people go out to vote. Uh, I do hope 3% is enough. Um, and then really I have my eyes uh, on how do we do better next year? Because this kind of back and forth for me doesn't move our community forward and doesn't help uh, the situation. I do think there are some things. I think improvements have been made all along. Uh, in the process, and I think there are obviously and clearly more more room to grow. So I'm going to leave it there. I do have some positive things I want to share. Um, really want to give a shout out to Officer Tim Barker um, for his pilot uh, youth leadership program. Uh, last week he had, I think, 15 youth involved and uh, more on a waiting list that would like to see a program like that continue. Um, and also uh, thank him. He gave me the opportunity to come in and facilitate one of the team building activities, which is uh, something I used to do a lot of in my former life, and um, it was a lot of fun uh, to, to watch the kids and hear their insights and uh, see them grow even in a short period of time. So uh, thank you, Officer Barker, for doing that. Uh, and then also want to wish all the uh, Scarborough residents out there who are doing the Try for a Cure this weekend um, good luck. I'm one of them. Um, it's a very special day for me and my family. I have a lost a brother and a father to cancer, and I have a mother and a uh, brother who will, or survivors who will be there. So uh, my sister and I are both doing it, um, and uh, a lot, as are a lot of other Scarborough residents. So if you can avoid Spur Wink at all, uh, Saturday or Sunday morning, um, we we athletes appreciate it because it's a little scary on the road with the bikes. Uh, and yeah, election day, please get out and vote.
That's it. Council Sinclair. Hey. Um, I, I'm going to leave it at, I just hope, I hope people vote. Um, you can't, it's like we always say every year you can't complain if you don't vote. Um, but that's really true. Um, with these types of town elections, every single vote really does matter. Um, and we see it when they're, um, when they're close. So it's important for people to vote whichever side they are on. And um, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't pass, it's, it's going to be rough. I mean, we thought it's not, it's not going to be pretty. Um, but if, if it doesn't pass, then we've got, we've got work to do, and we're going to do it. We're going to commit to do it. That's our job. That's why we're elected to be here. Um, I hope that we get a good um, turnout on the 26th for our roundtable. Um, we're really looking for um, community involvement in that. And um, I just, I, I made a comment at the last finance committee meeting, and it's really like it's stuck with me over the last week, but um, this community is really a lot different than it used to be when I ran six years ago, um, and not in a positive way, which is sad. Um, it's not the community that I moved to 14 years ago, 16 years ago now. Um, and I truly believe that we can get back there. I think we can get back to that community. Um, but it's going to take a lot of hard work, and it's going to take um, a lot of us, including myself, um, making some personal changes and, and making some, some work changes. But I think we can do it if we work together and we continue to communicate. And I think it's really, really important that regardless of what side you fall on, if you're a yes, if you're a no, that's the way that you feel and that's the choice and the vote that you're making that's best for your family and your situation. And nobody should be shamed or embarrassed or feel like they can't be honest about the way they voted for fear of retribution. Um, to hear that and to see that um, makes me uh, emotional, makes me sad that we've gotten to that point or that our community, we've let, we've let our community get to that point because we're better than that. We're so much better than that. Um, because when it boils down to it, we're all really good people. Um, and we all want the same thing. We want a beautiful, thriving, successful community where people want to move to. And I'm not sure that we have that right now. And I think we have a lot of work to do. But I know that I sit up here with six other people and a town manager that, and, a, and a town clerk who really, really works hard um, that's very committed to making that happen and for us to come back together again, um, whether we agree or disagree on where the budget falls or where the tax meter, where the meters fall, because I do not agree with that and you know that. Um, uh, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. And I think we can get there. But we're going to have to work hard. I'm done. Thank you. Councilor Hayes? <coughs> yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, I was kind of hoping we wouldn't go down this pathway tonight, but it seems like we are. I think I just encourage everybody get out and vote. Your vote's really, really important. This is a really, really important issue for our community. I mean, I will say, and it's really kind of, and I think I'll kind of echo some things Councillor Foley and Councillor St. Clair said, it's, it's really kind of sad that we're talking about sides and we're talking about who's right and who's wrong um, because this is our community. And so what I really hope, the information is out there. The town website has all the numbers. It has all the exhibits. It has the information so you can go to it and make your own decisions about what those numbers mean to you and how you interpret them. But please, take some time, get educated, but please, please come out and vote. 
and let us know. And I, I'm really curious about it. I really believe in sort of a continuous improvement process. Really, really want to look ahead to next year. How can we do this differently so we can bring our community together so everybody's voices can be heard and we can pass the budget with the town's consensus the first time through? What we're doing is not healthy for our communities. It's not healthy for relationships. So please take some time. The information is there. Go to the town website. That is trusted information. Those are the numbers. Um, look at it and draw your own conclusions. And, and please come to the polls and let us know what you think. Thank you. Councilor Chiazzo. So uh, I, I wish uh, sometimes we could have uh, public discussions about civics because I think it's very important for us all to understand roles and types of government and forms of government and things like that and uh, what a true democracy really is versus a representative uh, republic or a representative form of government which we have, but that's certainly a comment for another time uh, and another discussion. Um, I, I, I also wanted to clarify some of the comments that were made earlier from the podium of what the purpose of councillor comments really are. Um, I think we, while we debate very vigorously, uh, decorum is incredibly important to this body and we have rules that we follow for a reason. Um, however, councillor comments are kind of our opportunity to express our opinions because collectively is the only time that we have any authority. Individually, we have zero authority. So councillor comments are a way for us to inform the public and let them know kind of where our minds are and where our approaches are when we have debates and deliberations and I do think that they are important. So I, I just want to state why it's really in the town's best interest to pass this budget this time around. Um, there's extremism on both sides and extremism in any form is not constructive. Um, we don't have unlimited resources for education Likewise, I know as a parent, <laughs> the easiest thing for me to do is to simply just say no without any uh, rhyme or reason behind it. So I, I really think uh, to some of the other comments we've heard, the discussion moving forward needs to be on the process moving forward and not the, um, the, the, um, the details or the spinning of certain statistics one way or another. I think that is counterproductive. Um, right now what I haven't heard from either side, and I'm not singling out one or the other, but I haven't heard really solutions from either extreme. So what we're left to do then as a community is to try and find the middle ground and try and find the compromise and try and find the way to move the community forward in a way that's not uh, destructive to its infrastructure, to its social interactions, to its character, um, and, 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 I'm, and I'm hoping that we can do that with this vote. I mean, I liken this basically to uh, spaghetti sauce, okay, as an Italian, that's an analogy I hope I can relate to, okay? If you're a business and you're making spaghetti sauce and the price of your tomatoes goes up 7%, you don't pass a 7% price on to your consumers or your customers. You might pass a 2 or 3% price increase on to your customers because those tomatoes, while they're an important part of your ingredients, they're not the only part of the ingredients. And that's in essence what we're trying to do. So yes, you can sit there and say the percentage of costs or, or the percentage of the budget for the schools has gone up X percent. But you've got to look at it from a holistic perspective in my opinion. The facts are that the bill that the this, the citizens of Scarborough are going to get for all of the services in town that we get is in all likelihood going to be less than 3%. So let's talk about what happens if this budget doesn't pass. Uh, I personally am firmly committed to the one town, one budget approach. And what that means is if it doesn't pass, clearly we're going to have to make reductions. And I will advocate vehemently that those reductions should come from both sides because it's our community. And we need to approach these things in, I believe, and I firmly believe, in ways that aren't specific to special interests. It's not about parents. It's not about seniors. It's not about regions of the town. It's about the community as a whole. So if this budget doesn't pass, 
then the question becomes where do those reductions come from? And we've, I think it's been very clearly stated by every department and every department head uh, on the town and the school side that the next round will result in reductions in services. Period. I mean, that's just what we're facing. That's a fact. You can argue with me where those come from, and we will have, I'm sure, vigorous debates and discussions on where those cuts will come from. But all votes should be informed, and you should be aware of consequences of those outcomes. And if the budget doesn't pass, we're going to be looking at more cuts, and we're going to be looking, I'm going to strongly advocate for both sides. So it's time to stop thinking in the budget in terms of special interests. We've got to start thinking about this as a community effort. And I really hope that we've reached that compromise where we're not giving everything that the educate people who strongly support education want. We certainly are not uh, uh, reducing taxes to a level that's unsustainable, but we have made reductions in the tax rate. I hope we can all take that little bit of victory on each side, and that's the definition of compromise, get this budget passed, and start working to some of the other councillor comments on moving the community forward. Using the budget year in and year out as a protest towards what's going on in the community only hurts us, and it hurts the individuals who are advocating against that very process. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't like the way the town's being run and you vote against supporting the town and the way it's being run, the town's not going to be run well and you're not going to have anything to support. So I, 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 I hope we can push forward. I hope we get a high turnout. I hope the budget passes. And I will certainly be the first one to put positive information and, and, and a nice happy spin on it in August. Uh, but until then, I, I, I have some real concerns. And some real concerns that... Uh, you know, we're not able to mend those wounds that we're reopening and we're not going to be able to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. A um, couple of things. First, um, I got to think about a couple of things, but let's general announcements. First is, wanted to, ref um, I just learned of this um, as my wife um, reprimanded me while I was driving. As of effective, I believe, on Monday, July 23rd, the new expanded distracted driving law is going mm -hmm. to effect regarding cell phone usage. So I hope everyone goes out there and finds out, um, in essence, uh, you can't use your cell phone except for a phone call and it has to be voice activated, plus a bunch of other things that are going on around that distracted driving. So you should be aware of those changes because it's coming fast. Um, really, the only other item... Um, I'm going to keep this simple. You know, uh, first of all, uh, for the last 32 years, 33 years, I've been part of a program called Darigo Boy State. It's a program of the American Legion. And uh, this past year, I've been fortunate to have been appointed as its director and carrying on the tradition of that program. And the fundamental part of that is to teach young men, because uh, there is a girl state, I'm not part of that, um, but young men and women that you really have only one real responsibility in our democracy, and that is to get out and vote. And I really hope that everyone gets out and votes tomorrow. We have that as a responsibility, um, given the rights that we have and the comfort that we live in and out of the respect for the veterans that have given us that right. So I really do hope that we have people that get out tomorrow and vote in uh, absentee or get out to the poll and vote on Election Day, which is next Tuesday. But please vote, because um, that's when um, it becomes clear to us what direction to go. Um, I agree with... Um, parts of every statement that was said here tonight. And I think that there's one clear message, and that is that while this community may be different than what it was even 20 years ago when I first started, the soul and the heart and the resiliency of this community hasn't changed. We just, you know, from generation to generation or from year to year, the focus of our emotion and the focus of our passion just changes depending upon what is coming forward to us. A couple of years back, that resiliency was about dogs on the beach. This year, it's, uh, it's about educational funding um, and how education is being treated. Um, personally, I think that the issue that we're dealing with is about an anti-educational stance by a generation that doesn't want to contribute to the educational system any longer because it's too expensive. I respect it. I don't agree with it, but I respect that. And I think that we need to look at a longer-term solution, um, at least look at it. I'm not saying that we should do it, and there are other communities such as York that looked at how it uh, portions its taxes as well as how it handles, um, you know, uh, certain qualifications and classifications where seniors 
in certain groups might be able to uh, forego paying their t uh, educational tax portion in a given year and then it gets backloaded on t as a lien onto the property so that when it's sold it, it does get paid back to the community. There are solutions and we need to look at something given that demographic and what their needs are. Um, so we ourselves have to look at a longer term solution um, as well. Um, I think it's important based on some of the information and my comments are being driven by an incident that happened this morning that I won't go in great detail um, but I do want to at least mention communication and trust is a two way street. So far a lot of people have been pointing fingers at town council members and school board members saying that we're the ones not to be trusted, that we're the ones that are doing the shaming and the blaming. The fact is that this issue is a two way street and when you push people to a certain level they're going to be candid and call a spade a spade. That doesn't mean that they're wrong either as long as they are polite and respectful um, but the fact is that um, words do matter and signs do matter and the reason why I say that is that I did receive a call today and it really it's hard to even talk about it because I just I'm appalled. It was from a nice young lady of all of 80 years in which she thought her taxes were going up 6.8 percent and she was going to get pushed out of her home down in a smaller neighborhood. And not only was it because of the signs that she saw, it was also because of the communications and the conversations she received at other public events. Not necessarily related to taxes, there were other public events. And for someone to believe that and being told that, and being told that, just, that bad things can happen, including that we could foreclose on her property and move her out of her home, is an absolute lie. And that is not what this community is about. Landlords telling their tenants that they're going to increase their um, their tenants rents fifty to hundred dollars a month as a result of increases in the school funding or increases in the taxes when you actually look at the property that that person owned and calculated what that increase is the actual increase per property is less than ten dollars a year but yet the landlord is threatening it's not a cost transference they're threatening to increase the rent five times on a monthly basis not even on an annual basis this is the campaign that's out there and it's real and people are impacted by it. Whether it's unintentional or intentional, people are receiving that information that way and that's wrong. And I'm going to call a spade a spade as well. It's wrong. So we all have work to do. I think that um, it's actually um, the resiliency of this community is that we will always come back and make the right decision. And I believe that the community should vote yes. I hope that everyone votes yes for this budget. It is a wise investment. And if you don't believe that your money and your taxes are being invested wisely, go to the real estate section of the Sunday paper. Two weeks ago, the very top of uh, the entire page was all Scarborough properties. $1.2 million, $1.5 million, $900,000. And when you go into the tax space or the tax records, the last sale, 15 years ago they bought it for 200,000. That's the value of your investment in this community and I think that that is an awesome statement. Um, you can't get that at a bank and I'm a banker. I can guarantee you you're not going to get that return. So um, you know I think this is a good budget. I think that everyone in this town should vote for it um, and I think that this, continue, this community will continue to grow and move forward um, and we all have work to do um, in becoming better. So. Um, I appreciate everyone listening, and uh, with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Thank you.